What's up, freaks? This episode was brought to you by our good friends at CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is here to help you reimagine how you pay your healthcare costs, how you take care of your healthcare. CrowdHealth is not health insurance. It's actually trying to get more and more people to walk away from the health insurance industry because it's an opaque black box where you throw money in. You don't really know what's going on with it. You don't know how your healthcare costs are being negotiated on your behalf by the health insurance companies. Uh, you really don't know if you're being taken care of or not. CrowdHealth is here to fix that. What you do when you join CrowdHealth is you join a community of people who are taking care of themselves and who really want to uh, become sovereign with their health care. What you do is you become a member and you pay a monthly fee. That fee goes to a dedicated uh, health account, a bank account that you control, that you have visibility into, that you can always uh, take with you at the end of the day if you decide to move away from crowd health. You pay that monthly uh, subscription fee. And then if you ever have a health event, you bring your healthcare bill to the crowd health team. They go to the doctor, negotiate your health expense down to a lower price because they actually work on your behalf as opposed to the insurance companies. And then you pay the first $500 of your, your healthcare cost. And then it goes out to the crowd health community and your bill is crowdsourced to date. They've had 100% of their healthcare bills paid, uh, and it's a beautiful thing. They're also adding a Bitcoin component where a portion of your monthly subscription fee will get put into Bitcoin, so you have your fiat dollars alongside your Bitcoin account. Again, you have access to both at the end of the day if you ever want to walk away from it. Um, but again, it helps you lower your healthcare costs because they're there to negotiate on your behalf. It's a much more personal experience instead of calling a 1-800 number uh, when you become a crowd health member, you have a dedicated health advocate who is the same person throughout your your time with crowd health who's going to walk you through everything you need to do and make sure that you're getting the best care that you can get poss- that you can possibly get. Go to joincrowdhealth.com slash TFTC. The first thousand members of the Bitcoin uh, community are going to get, using the code TFTC, are going to get $99 a month for the first six months of their health care, uh, of their crowd health cost. So go check this out. Me and my family, we use CrowdHealth. We've decided to opt out of the traditional health insurance industry. Again, it's very opaque. feel like it doesn't really take care of us. So come join us in the CrowdHealth community. Use the code TFTC. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. Probably should be. Probably should be. It's all worth it when you wake up. After a few hours sleep, they're able to come to Bitcoin Commons and hang out with Shores. Shores, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Marty. It's a pleasure. I did not know you were going to be in town this week. I showed, I, I I have, showed up and you were here. I have excellent OPSEC. <laughs> I just appear and that's where I am. I'm happy you appeared because we can do this now. Sounds good. Yep. This feels like a long time coming. We met in person for the first time in Miami earlier this year, correct? I think I may have DM'd you somewhere in 2019 yeah, or something. Yeah, we've DM'd before. We've never met in person yep. until this year. That's correct. The uh, Miami conference. Yeah. yeah. You're on a bit of a trip right now. Yes. I uh, figured let's go to the U.S. just before Christmas. Um, so I went to uh, New York, visit the uh, Chainco Labs, uh, which is a very cool office too. And then I went to Nashville to the uh, Bitcoin Park, Bitcoin which is also very cool. Bitcoin Park is extravagant. Yeah, extravagant would be another term for it, but yeah, it's, it's super nice. Yes. Um, well kept secret, and um, and then well, now I'm here. Well, Chenko Labs is pretty extravagant too. Now that I think about it, their office is way up there in the sky in Midtown Manhattan. Yes, even with a, they have their own balcony, basically all <laughs> around the building, and just like on a typical day, maybe four people there. So, well, probably a bit more now, but it is like it's a lot of floor space per employee. Um, yeah, we're a bit more humble here at Bitcoin Commons. Like still the, nice. Still very nice. We've got good music playing at all times. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that. And yesterday it was bumping in here. 
It was uh, jam-packed in the comments. There's like 10 people? Yeah, it's jam-packed. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a good vibe. How are you liking your trip to the States this time around? Yeah, it's, a, it's always fun to visit. Um, so, good times. Uh, it's always a bit tiring, so I'm always happy to go home too afterwards, but I, I never regret visiting. So. That's the way I am. I'm not like a big traveler. I get very exhausted while traveling. I used to just travel for the sake of traveling, and I've gone to a mode where I like to have a reason to go somewhere, but then I'll add a lot of, of empty time around it. So let's say there's a Socratic happening in a Socratic seminar happening in Berlin. I'll make you know I'll make that two days Berlin, uh, with the rest of the two days are completely unplanned. So the same with this trip. I guess I figured I'll just go to these places and then hopefully I show up and there's somebody there. And otherwise, I guess I'll I'll go at work at the Starbucks or something. <laughs> just puts around. Yeah, we got bit devs here in Austin tomorrow night. Exactly, that was excellent timing. I didn't know that before I planned the trip. Uh, we've had some stars come through. We got you here this month. We had merch last month, or the month before. Mm -hmm. Always have Lisa, uh, Buck, Justin, Ben in town. I'm excited for tomorrow night. Yeah, I don't know who's going to be around tomorrow, but. Uh... Yeah, it's the holidays. You never know when people leave. You might not be able to get out if Senator Warren gets her way. Yeah, uh, she uh, wants me to perform forced labor, I believe, uh, writing backdoors into open source node software to do government things for them. I don't know. I haven't read the actual bill, and I'm sure it's not exactly that way. But uh, but But what I read from one of your senators is that they want open source software to contain things to do compliance. Yes. And, and so even if that was possible, you're basically telling volunteers to go and build something that is not how it works. Like if the government wants that compliance software to exist, they can write it themselves. And then, you know, other volunteers can take a look at it and say, well, this doesn't seem to comply with how Bitcoin is supposed to work. <laughs> so go ahead and, you know, make your own fork, but maybe not here. Uh, but the idea that developers have to do this for the government makes no sense. So I guess they'll, they'll you know, to get around the First Amendment problems there, they'll, they'll phrase it something like, well, if you publish some code that doesn't have the compliance, you go to jail. I don't know how that works. I mean, that gets you into tornado cash discussions. Yeah, we're getting pretty tyrannical here. Well, so, so I mean, Senator's proposing crazy bills. I don't think that's tyrannical yet because apparently she has proposed like 600 bills and only one has passed. So... I mean, it's probably a big publicity stunt. Yeah, I've I've heard crazier things proposed, but in general, the idea that, uh, yeah, you you can't tell volunteers what code to write. So if you want to have, if you want as a government to change how Bitcoin itself works, this is not the way to go about it. No, and the fact that you're here today, well, this bill that, frankly, most likely will not get passed. Mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting opportunity to talk about. The nature of Bitcoin. We have your book on the table, Bitcoin, a work in progress. You've been contributing to Bitcoin Core for many years now, so you have a very, uh, a, a well above average understanding of how the code base works. You've written about it and you've uh, contributed to it. And so some of the particular points of the bill is Senator Warren would like to designate Bitcoin miners as money transmitting businesses. Um, Bitcoin full nodes as money transmitter businesses and wallet software as like KYC AML compliant pieces of, of product software products and well so th those are very very different things mm -hmm. first of all um, I guess the argument with miners they would I guess they would say well those coins you know miners are creating coins and they're they're sorting transactions so I don't know if you can make that argument legally it sounds undesirable uh, presumably that would, you know, if they actually did that, that could cause miners to leave or it could cause miners to comply. But the question is if that would be economical for them. If you just look at the incentives for a miner, right, the, for now, the, all they need to do is, is put transactions together in a block and that's it. Uh, and presumably they'll need some licensing for their um, power usage uh, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, to get a full money transmitter license, like even knowing what that what on earth that would mean in the context of a miner, because generally the idea is just you're just blindly putting blocks together. You're not 
you know, you don't know where the money is coming from or where it's going, and that's that's kind of how the protocol is supposed to work. So they might decide to say, okay, you know, we want to stay in the U.S. and we're going to play along with this game and we'll come up with some bizarre way to comply with this regulation, and maybe they'll do that. But it is internationally competitive. Yes. So there's only so much they can do that you know could still be creepy. I mean, the first things you might think about is just simple censoring of specific blacklisted coins. That's that's something that seems almost inevitable that I guess it will happen at some point somewhere. Well, it's already happened, hasn't it? Haven't the uh, Iranian blacklisted coins? As far as I know... Aren't there, isn't there, aren't there a list of addresses on a OFAC list? Yeah, the list exists, but as far as I know, it has not... They've not actually been censored. No. So there has been recently a site built called um, uh, miningpool.observer, which keeps an eye on every mining pool out there, as far as they publish that they are there, whether or not they're doing any censorship. And this is not trivial to detect because it's a statistical process, process right? So if, if, if you're on, let's say, it's very simple, they put you on the OFAC list and your address is publicly known, and now you decide to spend some coins from that address. That transaction goes into the mempool, and then based on the fee, you would expect at some point this thing to be mined. So if you're paying, say, one Satoshi per byte, and the mempool is very busy, then no pool will mine your coin. Well, that's not censorship. That's just because you're not paying enough. But at some point, you can see, okay, you're paying a very high fee by any measure we think this should have been in the next block. And then you could you might see a pattern where one or two pools you know, did mine a block, did not include your transaction, even though they included transactions that paid far less than your transaction, and your transaction has been around for a while, so they probably knew about your transaction. And if that happens a couple of times in a row, then you can say, well, we think this and this and this pool is committing some sort of censorship. And that's what that uh, mempool.observer is trying to detect, and so far it's not found anything. No, those OVAC coins have been moved, or coins from those addresses on the list have been moved. And then again, you mentioned, and it's it's a, it's a non-trivial thing. Like you can start this cat and mouse game, and I guess you know that could be that could happen as a result of this bill. You know, maybe this is an opening move, and then the compromise would be that they will start censoring that address. But then, of course, you as the hypothetical sanctioned person, which is move your coins. Well, f- first of all, you would just send your transaction as you would always, because there'll be plenty of pools that will not censor you, so your transaction will take a little bit longer, but not much. Um, so, but if all pools start playing the game somehow, then you would move your coins. I guess you would you would use some way to avoid using that address. Well, yeah. and then you mentioned it earlier, but there is that aspect right now. It's popular within the Bitcoin mining pool layer for these pools to include their name, or maybe they're including somebody else's name in the Coinba- mm-hmm. Coinbase transaction message. Oh, well, that would be funny if they would include somebody else's name and sort of like mine a no-fact transaction and blame some other company for it. Right. So you can play those games or you could just simply... That's always a trend that's perplexed me. Maybe it's just a tool. Why they dox themselves, yes. the mining pools? I think it has to do with getting well, more customers. Mm-hmm. More, more mi- uh, customers, by that I mean miners that point their hash power to the pool because as a miner, you can pick whatever pool you want. If you own the machine, I think you've got one over there. Well, that one's not going to do much. But I've got two. I've got the 21 computer here, too. Oh, that, remember that thing? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Um, that's a good space heater. <laughs> um, so basically, you as a miner choose which pool you aim at, and then you want to pick a pool that's reasonably big, because otherwise you may never get any coins out of it, because there's you know there's some randomness, some variance, some luck. Um, so miners want to, pools want to say that, look how big we are. And one way you can show how big you are is by simply putting your stamp, your brand basically in every Coinbase. Hmm. Um, so far that comes at no, no trade off, but I, that can, you know, this, this could change that game theory where it's better as a pool to be anonymous. However, it wouldn't give them that much anonymity either, because if you have a pool where you can sign up randomly, then I guess the government can sign up for the pool as well and just kind of listen and see what blocks they're creating. Mm-hmm. So I don't think removing the name from the Coinbase transaction is going to do that much for minor privacy for the big pools. Yeah. But yeah. if you're talking about a world where, let's say, you know, the U.S. has some influence globally, so they could first try to make these U.S. companies comply somehow with some censorship rules, but then they'll very quickly find out that's utterly pointless because it's only a small percentage of the hash power, so the worst you're doing is you're delaying some transactions a little bit 
but you're not stopping them. So then, you you know, the U.S. might go around and globally lobby more countries to implement similar regimes and, and get to above 51% compliance. That's when we have a problem. Uh, but you're still just delaying it. So the real painful thing, and I don't want to give anybody, especially Warren, any ideas, but the real painful thing is once you start forcing pools to reorg that blocks. So it's not just about what you include in your block, it is whether you build on top of a block that is bad. Bad, you know, in scare quotes. Yeah. Um, but then That's when it gets dangerous, because then if you get 51% to comply with that, um, of course, that's expensive. Exactly. So that's the other point. Like, But that's where your QE comes in. <laughs> because now the government can say, well, you know what? We know that's expensive, but we think fighting crime is so important that if you uh, do this, reorg, we'll pay you the, the cost of the uh, of the lost revenue. But then it's a catch-22 because they're printing more money, devaluing. Yeah, but it's only a fraction of the of the QE that would go to this particular thing. Interesting. It'd be pretty expensive. But it might not be that expensive in practice because just show, doing it once or twice will create an incentive for miners to sell sensor because you don't want to be... Like, it's fine to be the miner not mining on top of that block because you get compensated by the government. But if you're the miner creating that block, oh, but now there's a good chance your block is going to go stale. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, nobody's going to build on top of your block. So now you're going to self-censor, even though no government's telling you to censor. And yeah. then, then you get into this whole rat race where, okay, maybe people will just pay more fees in order to get around this, et cetera, et cetera. But that's all unexplored territory. Then we get into the social aspect of it as well, because in the scenario you just mentioned, it's forced labor to an extent. The right? scenario where software developers have to change things in the code, yes. Well, even on the mining pool... There. Well, the mining, you're forced I don't to, know. I mean, the mining pools, I guess they'll play a liability game where it's like you, you can you can run a mining pool as a business, but if your business is doing anything illegal, you go to jail. And in that sense, any illegal. business that has to comply with the government is, is doing forced labor in, in that very broad sense. Yes. But I think that's still a bit different than telling volunteers to go and do something that they otherwise wouldn't be doing, even though they're not being paid by the hour to do something. So those companies, you know, would tell their employees to write some software in their pool. That's still different from saying, okay, you know, one of the Bitcoin core developers, please make this thing for us. It's like, no. <laughs> and again, they could write it themselves, but that's not, I think, what Warren is proposing to become uh, the, the U.S. government becoming Bitcoin core contributors. No. So. The, uh, no, I, I get that distinction. So yeah, how... So, that, so, so the, but the question is, who gets, who gets in trouble when that doesn't happen? Because you're telling a bunch of volunteers to go do something. The volunteers are like, yeah, I don't personally feel like doing that. Are each of these volunteers then immediately in trouble? Or is there some sort of collective punishment going on? Or what if one of the volunteers does decide to build it, but it gets rejected by the other volunteers? Is that a problem? I don't know. Yeah, can they force... I guess, could they go to the maintainers that have access? Well, they can make the maintainers merge something. I yeah. guess the maintainers might not do it. But even if they did do it, then people would simply stop downloading, hopefully stop downloading software from those maintainers. Yeah. Um, so it's a cat and mouse game. But in terms of going back to like... But I don't think she's thought that through. I don't this, think this whole aspect. So it makes it a bit theoretical. It's like... Yeah, I don't think she's thought many things through. Um, she definitely didn't write the bill either. It was some lobbyist, I imagine. Well, okay, which lobbyist is that interested in this? Probably the banks or... Okay. Some. Aren't the banks also excited about crypto now? They pretend to be. Okay. So that, yeah. They pretend to be at least. Maybe some are. Yeah. I'm always a bit skeptical of the idea that there are people really afraid of Bitcoin. I think they should be, but I don't think they actually are. But then that does raise the question of who's writing these bills. Why should they be and why do you think they aren't? Well, they should be because Bitcoin, you know, potentially could uh, wreak havoc uh, in the, at least in the fiat system. It doesn't put, but that doesn't put banks out of business. Banks are still, could still exist. Um, I don't necessarily think that's going to happen, it, but it could happen. So that could be a reason for to have the fear. But I don't think... You know, people who don't like Bitcoin usually haven't really looked into it that much either. So I don't think they would be afraid of it. They, they, I think most of the people who don't like Bitcoin are more surface level annoyed by 
crime or annoyed by uh, energy consumption. And that's the, the extent of what they don't like about Bitcoin. I don't think they see it as a, as a threat to their existence. Oh. Because by the time people do understand it, they actually like it and they stop being opposed to it. Stop being naysayers. That's kind of my, uh, my theory there. Hey, you gotta learn more. You gotta read Bitcoin a work in progress. Yeah, which does not cover any of the things we just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to like Warren's bill, like technically like, you touched on it, but like let's try and steel man why the definitions she's trying to thrust on these particular actors and stakeholders within the Bitcoin network. Well, the, the idea of, of making minus money transmitters has been floated by other people too. Um so I'm sure they'll keep trying that. But are the, what, are, what are miners actually doing? And would you define it as money transmission? Well, they secure the network. So ideally, that's the way I would see it. They're, they are basically adding security to it, and they're, they should be sort of ignorant of what's in it. Just like a water company you know, is not facilitating crime by making water go somewhere. But the analogy is not that clean. So you know, they are help, helping... Yeah, they're they're creating blocks basically, so they're adding security and they're preventing double spends that way. So they're deciding the order of transactions. But in theory, they have some ability to censor it. Um, though, like I said, that's not so easy because you'd need to collude with fifty-one percent of the miners in order to do that censorship. And to demand them to do such collusion sounds to me like a bad idea. Yeah, because but that doesn't mean it can't politically happen. <clears throat> No. But then going back to the social aspect, does that type of demand validate Bitcoin's value prop, which then emboldens people to work harder to maybe distribute hash rate more granularly? That's another thing. Like in that situation, somebody with mining businesses here in the United States, I would simply just turn off my miners and sell my ASICs to somebody. Well, that comes to the cost aspect of this. But if the government is subsidizing it, that might not be an issue. But I'd rather not get paid by the government to censor Bitcoin. Then you're going to sell your minus to somebody who does want to be paid by the government to censor Bitcoin. <laughs> so I find this very hard to predict. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we're anywhere near that, that part of the game yet. And it does not seem like the lowest hanging fruit. So uh, when it comes to regulations around Bitcoin, I think it's much more likely to, to happen at the level of custodians that are actually holding somebody else's Bitcoin. So they they can just hold that money hostage, as I like to call it reverse ransomware. So instead of paying money to get your data back, you must give data to get your money back, basically, because it's sitting on the exchange. And they're like, oh, well, we'd like to see your password now. This has been a good week for preventing that. Uh, people have been encouraged to move their coins off the exchange, yes. Yes. But at that point, they're already too late, right? It's still there. So now a lot of people might be in a rush to get their money off exchanges, and that is a good opportunity for those exchanges to ask uh, some extra questions. Yes. Hey, hold up. Before we look for the Bitcoin that you're asking for, uh, we're going to need you to, to upload a selfie with your passport, please. Yeah. Yeah. And does, do you think it gets harder to attack the mining layer as time goes on? No. At the moment, I think it's getting easier because you have all these publicly listed U.S.-based companies mm-hmm. that, you know, and where censorship is still very, very cheap. Relative, at least the the the, um, the naive form of censorship, the the one that doesn't work. So, so in your mind, what is the path towards a significantly and sufficiently robust mining layer? Well, I think you know you had Matt Corallo on. I'm sure to talk about some of the work he was doing by making it easier for. You want to have more pools, basically. Mm-hmm. So it should be easy to run a pool, and it should be easier. F- and the other thing is, it should be easier for miners to do the uh, for actual miners by that i mean the people who have the machines to do their own transaction selection so that the choke point is not the pool operators but it is the individual people hosting the machines and then the optimistic part of me would say well those machines are going to places where electricity is cheap and that's increasingly probably going to be very remote places and very dispersed all over the world and that could be good because now you have to go after a bunch of mountain men basically um So that's probably it, but I don't know if it's going to happen. Well, I can confirm I do have miners on top of mountains. On top of the mountain? Uh, On top of like a a ridge of a mountain, yeah. Okay, that's a pretty cool spot to have them. Yeah. A lot of strand of natural gas. So so that helps, like if a lot of, if if the selection of what actually goes into a block is happening by a lot of different people in a lot of different places, 
uh, it is more difficult to require all of them to basically not just censor things, but also remove blocks that are unwanted. Mm-hmm. So that might help. Yeah. But I, I don't think, you know, Bitcoin is not destined to succeed. So no, definitely not. It, it could, this could be its failure mode. We could look back in a hundred years and say, yeah, yeah, this, you know, they first, they tried to digital cash, which had a central counterparty. Well, that didn't work because the government just took down the central car, uh, the central counterparty. And then we tried this Bitcoin thing and it seemed to work really well, but unfortunately it's too easy to capture the mining process. So yes. I need to come up with something completely new. Yeah. Um, but it might also be that this will work out fine, that it's just too much pain to, to go directly after the blockchain. Yeah, I think that's probably one of my favorite Greg Maxwell posts is his post on somebody asked him, what, like, how's Bitcoin going to die? And his response was complacency. Yeah, I think he's right about that. Because um, one of the, the risks is that if Bitcoin gets or if most of Bitcoin's use gets captured, so even in a case where nobody attacks the blockchain, but all the Bitcoin is living on KYC exchanges and everybody has to have permission for everything, the project becomes less interesting for, for developers and you'll have fewer and fewer developers that are you know, actually working on it. And then the system could just die from lack of maintenance. Because yeah. Yeah, it's, not, it's not the case that if you turn on a Bitcoin node now that it's still going to be fine a thousand years from now. Unfortunately, software has to keep changing a little bit at least to fix all the bugs. But worse than that, you could have a selection where all the developers that are left at some point are not very good and they make it worse. And so they might even break it. What is the state of Bitcoin development? I've been hearing a lot of burnout uh, in terms of people. I'm seeing a lot of new people. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of an- anonymous people, or at least people that I don't know who they are. Um, so that, I think, is a good sign. Would you deem them competent from what you've seen? Well, that takes time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, th- I think, I mean, the process, I think, still works. The process being somebody can come in with no experience, make a pull request or a suggested piece of code, to the Bitcoin Core so- source code, and then lo- several other people with more experience will come in and say, "Well, did you think about this? And maybe you want to improve this thing." And then they'll go back and improve it. And so I think that process still works fine. Bugs do get in, but that's always been the case. Yeah. So I, I, right now I'm quite bullish. It's going quite well. Okay. Yeah. So you're bullish on Bitcoin. On the software, yes, and yeah. on the on the project in general, yes. Hmm. I'm just like to paint like worst case scenarios. Yeah. Um, that might never happen, but those are also interesting to think about. Yeah. I always go back and forth with this. I I do think. But but you're right that there are burned out developers and that has, I think, probably something to do with just if you've done something for a long time, at some point you get tired of it, Mm -hmm. especially if you work too hard. Uh, Burnouts just happen in any job. Uh, It may also have something to do with a certain Australian uh, (laughs) causing a lot of just personal headache for these developers. Um. Yeah. Are you burnout at all? I don't think so. No. But I try, at least in my last couple of years, I've not done this full time. I've done it like a few days a week on average. And that helps me sort of have enough other things to be interested in uh, that I don't burn myself out. Yeah, you're telling me. And hopefully I can keep doing that longer, basically. Yeah. You're telling me earlier you've been focusing mainly on review and commenting. and. Yes, I have found myself doing mostly code review and testing stuff. Mm-hmm. Um which is, th- there's a huge bottleneck there anyway, so that is useful to do. Uh, just to, yeah, basically somebody makes a proposed change, you look at their code, you see if you can break it, you leave a comment on GitHub, and then they'll have some homework, and then sometime later they'll say, okay, I fixed it, and you try it again. That's kind of how it works. Yeah. In your mind, what are like the most pressing priorities of the project overall? Oh, man. Um, there's a lot. Right. Um, there's a, there's a, quite a few things that are, I don't think there's anything urgently immediately broken. Those things will get fixed. If there's any, if there's a short term bug, you know, people will rush in and fix it. But there are these long term things like the blockchain is getting bigger, um, uh, that, that you want to deal with somehow. Uh, but these are long running, uh, long running projects. I wrote a few in the book that I think are interesting. Uh, they're not urgent though. That's always the problem with these things. They're very cool and very promising, but, um, because, you know, people like to put out fires more. Yeah. Was U-Tree-XO one of those? Yes. And um, 
Assume UTXO possibly too. Though with UTXO maybe you won't need it. Yeah, UTXO is very cool, right? It's um maybe go a little bit back. We all know the blockchain is big. That's one problem. What's it at now? Like six hundred gigabytes or something, mm -hmm. maybe five hundred. Uh, I had to prune my laptop recently for the first time. I could have I could have been a little bit more efficient with some of the other stuff that's on there, but I, I, I pressed the prune button and that that did feel like a special moment. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it wouldn't for normal people. Um, but I always found it nice to have the whole blockchain. You don't need to keep the whole blockchain. There's not that much practic practical utility in it. The idea is you download the whole thing, you check every block. Once you've checked that a block is okay, in principle you can toss it. There are a few little things why you may want to keep a few weeks around, right? There might be a big reorg or you might load an, an old wallet and want to check some of the previous transactions in it. So then you need to be able to rewind a bit, but you don't have to keep the whole history. You've, you've checked it. It's okay. The thing that you have to hold on to is the state of the blockchain. The UTXO set, as it's called, is the set of coins as in who owns what. And the way you determine who owns what is by replaying the whole blockchain from, from the Genesis block on. So the first block will say, okay, there are now 50 coins. They belong to Satoshi or this mm -hmm. anonymous address. And then the next block says, okay, now there's 100 coins and they belong to this other person. And then some future block will, will say, okay, this coin no longer exists. And now this, because the money moved to this other place. And the only way to figure out who owns what is basically do all that transaction by transaction. But this database of who owns what is getting also quite big. And more importantly, there's no natural limit on it. Like it could grow infinitely large. And we see that I think it's getting particularly large on a certain fork of Bitcoin, um, but it, it could also get large on Bitcoin itself. And what U3XO is trying to do is basically remove the burden of holding on to this information. So right now, every single Bitcoin node has to hold on to who owes, owns which co coin. And with U3XO, the hope is that you don't have to keep track of that anymore. When somebody wants to spend coins, it's up to them to prove that those coins existed. So mm -hmm. it flips the burden of evidence, which is kind of cool. And how if somebody wants to spend proof that that UTXO previously existed. Magic. And is spendable. Uh, basically magic. No, um, <laughs> I think that there's multiple ways to do it. I think the general term is an accumulator, but it, um, yeah, how do I explain it? I, I guess you're, do you know Merkle trees? I understand the concept, yeah. Yeah. So what you can do is you can, every user will have the, uh, the top hash of the Merkle tree. Mm -hmm. And you know that that represents who owns what, but you don't know what's in the Merkle tree. And so when somebody wants to spend it, they have to reveal some part of the Merkle tree, some leaf at Their the bottom branch. of the Merkle tree, yeah. and they'll have to show basically all the way up. So like for every layer that you go up in the Merkle tree, you need to have one piece of data, like 64 bytes. So if you're 20 layers deep in the Merkle tree, and that is a very, very big Merkle tree, um, yeah, you need to provide 20 pieces of data, and that'll prove that you know what was in there, and that proves that you actually own that coin. Mm -hmm. And then for the rest, it's the same as always. You have to provide the signatures and satisfy the script and all that sort of stuff. But the proving that a coin existed, you will be able to do by the person spending it will just have to send the proof along with it. And in terms in... And, and that means that... Yeah, the, the person checking it no longer needs to keep track of the whole Merkle tree. It just keeps track of the tip, and it'll get these pieces of evidence, and it will evaluate them one by one. Yeah, and so it's the tip of that Merkle tree created via the information included in all the leaves and branches below it. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And basically, spending a transaction means that you are changing the Merkle tree, so you're removing one leaf from the Merkle tree, and you're adding another leaf somewhere else in the Merkle tree. So you get a new tip and a new, new piece of evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one way to do it, but there's other mathematical techniques to do the same thing that will have the same effect, but don't use Merkle trees. And that's what things like uh, Tash Dreja is, uh, is or was working on. Well, he, he, uh, so is. he launched, he, he wrote the UTXO paper, right? Yes. Yeah. But I think there's some other people working on it too. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in terms of... So the nice thing about that is, I mean, the whole state is only like seven gigabytes now, I think, of who owns what, maybe 10. So you think that's not that much. Problem is, though, in order to very efficiently check if a new block is valid, you'll want to have that whole database in your RAM. Uh, because then you can very quickly look up, does this coin exist, does it not exist? You don't have to go to a hard disk and like you know look it up and then go back. And RAM is pretty scarce. 
Uh, plus the thing that there's no limit to this. It could get, you know, 100 gigs at some Same. point. Yeah. So that Utrixo would fix that problem. And what would the impact on the overall chain state be? Would it reduce that significantly or would, we, would it slow down the pace of growth? No, the blockchain itself won't change. It'll be just as big. Okay. Uh, in fact, and now I have to work from memory, which is never a good idea, I think it will actually get bigger. Uh, because uh, the problem is that these pieces of evidence, they do have to be recorded. Because if you only rely, I think if you only rely on the people spending it to, to give it to you, um, they'll, they'll give it to you as a node in the mempool, for example, when you're seeing it as an unconfirmed transaction. But then if you come along later and you want to download the whole blockchain, well, you still want to have these pieces of evidence. So I think it will actually make the blockchain bigger. Uh, so how does this help? Well, it helps because you don't have to store the blockchain. You just download it once, you check every block, and you can toss it. So in terms of the actual resources that you need would be far less RAM, like uh, no RAM, essentially, and no more disk space because you can just toss away old blocks. The downside is it's a little bit more bandwidth. And this is where Erlay comes in, correct? No, Erlay would come in... So Erlay comes in before, um, before you have any blocks. Mm -hmm. So what I talked about now is really about making it efficient when uh, even without a mempool, so just checking every block in the history of the blockchain, that would be more efficient with something like Utrixo. Now there's this other aspect of uh, when when you're running your node and a new block comes in live, let's say, that is that uh, that's where your mempool comes in. So your mempool holds all the unconfirmed transactions that you know about, and those might include the extra evidence or not. And then the question is, um, do you want to send your peers those unconfirmed transactions as well because they may want to know about it. And that eats up a lots and lots of bandwidth. And so early is a proposal to reduce that bandwidth okay. uh, in a smart way. So it's at the mempool level. Yes. To let everybody know what transactions are waiting to be included in a block. Yeah, and there's multiple reasons why you may want to know that. I mean, part of it is altruism. You just want to help spread those transactions because it's got to go to a miner somehow and it might you might go through your node to get to that miner. And the other is that, well, if you're waiting for somebody to pay you, it's nice to get a notification at least that something is on its way, although you, you can't trust it yet because it's not in a block. Um, and the third reason is that, it's a little bit more sophisticated, I guess, is that once there is a new block, um, you'll learn about it more quickly if you have this mempool. Because what happens is normally if you get a new block, let's say it's two megabytes, you would have to receive the whole two megabytes, then verify the whole two megabytes, check all the transactions in it, and then you say, okay, yes, I have a new block. Then you send it to your peers. And they also then need to download the whole thing, check the whole thing, and send it to their peers. So that's a slow process because it takes, you, know, you have to download things, check things. But because of the mempool, you can kind of skip ahead a bit. Um, you can already guess what's going to be in the next block because you have all these transactions in your mempool. And so instead of getting a whole two megabyte block, you're getting a header of the block and a list of transaction identifiers in the block, um, which you can verify much more quickly and then also forward much more quickly. So everybody having a mempool causes blocks to propagate faster. And that is useful in itself because you might say, well, I have low, t low time preference. I don't care that these blocks are you know, <laughs> propagated fast. That's, that's fair. Um, but the problem is, what if two miners find a block at the same time? Uh, that you, you know, you ideally want to avoid that scenario because that's basically wasting money, uh, and could, in a bad circumstances, lead to the network temporarily splitting. Uh, so it's good for the network for for the network to propagate blocks fast. So the mempool is useful for that too. Hmm. And that split has happened in like the last two years, correct? I mean, this all it, it often happens. I think probably. Not as often as it used to, mm -hmm. but once every, I think it's once every month or maybe even once every couple months, there will be two blocks produced at the exact same time. What is significantly more rare now is that you'll have uh, more than two blocks at the same time. So you might have two blocks at the same time and then both of these get a block on top of them and only then do they converge. I think that's very rare now and it used to be less rare. And I think in 2015, around a soft fork due to some other bugs, I think there were times that there might have been three or four or five blocks um, that it would just go off, build five blocks, and then suddenly it would switch to another chain. That so that's a lot of wasted uh, mining power. Mm -hmm. And of course, if your transaction is confirmed on one side of the that chain, but not on the other side of the chain, you also have a problem. Yeah. If you accepted uh, one confirmation. Okay. So, 
with Erlay. With like this. Yeah, so so then so now we've explained why the mempool itself is useful. But the downside of the mempool is that you are sending transactions around a lot. And this takes a huge, huge amount of bandwidth. So Erlay is an attempt to reduce how much bandwidth it takes to send these uh to send these transactions around to your peers. And I think it, it does that again with magic. <laughs> That's the way I would look because I don't fully understand the math either. But it, it tries to make some sort of uh, I don't think it's a fingerprint, but some sort of sketch. I think that's what they call it, a mini sketch mm -hmm. of your mempool. And the other side, your peer will do the same thing of their mempool. So they'll say like, my mempool is this and my mempool is that. And instead of sending the mempool itself, they'll send this summary or whatever it is of the mempool. And you compare those two summaries. And by comparing them, you know which transactions you're missing, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice. And there's some ratio between... Let's say you have a hundred thousand. Let's say you have ten thousand transactions in your mempool, and, and the other side has ten thousand transactions in the mempool. And if the difference is one, so there's only one transaction that's different, then you need maybe sixty bytes. A message you can send sixty bytes to the other side, and they'll know exactly what's missing. But if they're missing more, they won't know it at all. So you have to guess what what the size is of the difference between you and the other side, and that's sort of the math that uh, these folks have been working on. I think it was Gleb. Club and um, yep. I believe Peter helped him out with it or Sipo. Yeah. And interestingly enough, the math that's required for that is the same math that makes I believe is the same math that, that makes your iPhone recognize your fingerprint without storing the fingerprint. Do you believe Apple's not storing our fingerprints? Well, in theory, they don't have to. Whether they're doing it or not, that's a separate <laughs> question. But but the way they've done it is they don't have to. No, they they'll they'll know your fingerprint when they see it, but they won't know your fingerprint. Interesting. And this is the same kind of math. Okay. Which I can only explain at this level. It does sound like magic. Yeah, but it's not, of course. It's way over my head. Yeah. I can, I can deduce some of the uh, Merkle tree magic, but when when it comes to the early magic, it's uh, it's a bit harder for me. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, for me too. So that that helps. <laughs> but going back to you, tree XL, and speaking of the Merkle yeah. tree. My, my guess is you can, if you do go into that math, it'll come back to linear uh, linear algebra and like uh you know if you have two points you can draw a line between it if you have three points you can draw uh, uh, uh another curve through it etc and it's somewhat in in abstraction it's somewhat like that yeah um but back to like the bandwidth issue with ibd so the bandwidth we talked about now is for when you're already synced and you're just waiting for the new block and you're just gossiping the transactions in your mempool. Mm -hmm. Early should help reduce that bandwidth. Going back to U-Tree XO, mm -hmm. we'll make the chain state bigger, arguably. Then you still have those bandwidth issues on IBD, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so the downside is you'll have more bandwidth for IBD, and then the question is, what are you worried more about? Are you worried more about bandwidth, or are you worried about more about RAM and I don't know the answer to that and the answer might change over time so it might be that until say 2050 we're more worried about bandwidth maybe after 2050 when you know as bandwidth gets better maybe then the other another bottleneck appears mm -hmm. so that's a that's also hard to predict so I'm not saying that U3XO is a feta complete like it's going to happen like might never happen but it's it's an interesting proposal it is Bitcoin core. Especially it's promising proposal because it removes, I think it removes the last thing that's unbounded. So by unbounded, computer science usually mean like there's no natural limit to it. So blocks are limited per, per block. There's a hard limit on it. Um, the block chain itself is unlimited, but you don't have to store it. So in that sense, it's not creating an unbounded thing on your machine itself. Mm -hmm. um, and besides... So that's maybe a little bit more controversial, but you have ideas like assuming the UTXO set that James mm -hmm. O'Byrne is working on, where you start with a snapshot. And so you can, in theory, say, well, we don't care what happened in the last 50 years. We only start one year ago. Uh, though if you don't want to do that, you can still go all the way back. Yeah, and with assume UTXO, once you, if you are comfortable with the trade-off accepting the signatures at certain points of the block height history, and you do catch up the tip quickly, IBD happens in the background slowly over time. In the current implementation, but that sounds like something obvious that people might not want to do. 
because it takes up too much bandwidth. Yeah. Or RAM. No, because, yeah, because it would take up all the bandwidth, and the question is, are you likely going to find a problem? Of course, some people should keep doing that. So that's that's a difficult uh, question there. Yeah. But in principle, if you were to do that, then if you start using Bitcoin and you don't care about deep history, let's say it's the year, you know, 5,300, and maybe you care about the last 200 years, but, you know, you've read your history books and you're not aware of any controversy that happened earlier, maybe you're happy to download only the last 100 years worth of blocks. That's fascinating. So, so that means that the computer that you'll need in that far future doesn't have to have an infinite disk because it's it's going to download a limited set of blocks, maybe only 100 years worth of blocks or whatever is, is reasonable then. It won't need a lot of RAM because it has this UTXO or something like it that keeps the RAM low. And it doesn't need infinite CPU either because Bitcoin transactions are not that difficult to verify. So that's, that's what... Computer science tend to mean with unbounded, uh, not in this case, not unbounded. Everything is bounded. We know sort of, sort of the resources we'll need and we'll, those won't get worse in the future mm-hmm. with all these new innovations. Right now, th- things will keep getting worse in the future. And so you have to hope that Moore's law can keep up with it. Do you think it can? Well, so far it, uh, it seems to, but it's it's already behind. I think uh, Luke Dasher made a, a nice presentation a few years ago at, at one conference where he kind of looked at, okay, Right now, it takes way too long to download a blockchain on mobile, and it's going to take it. It's going to get. That's going to get worse until 2040 or 2050, or maybe even 2080, and then at some point it will stop getting worse because the blockchain is growing linearly. So every year, you know, it's getting so many gigabytes bigger, but it's not growing exponentially, whereas computers are getting exponentially faster, or bandwidth is getting exponentially faster. So exponential growth will at some point catch up. So if, if your home bandwidth gets 20% faster every year, uh, then if the blockchain doesn't grow, then every year you'll download the blockchain 20% faster. But because the blockchain does grow, actually every year it's going to take you longer to download the blockchain. But at some point in the future, and you can extrapolate it, it will actually take less time to download the blockchain. I'm just going to wait for those advancements to catch up. Yeah, and that's why he then proposed, and that's the more problematic part, to reduce the block size to 300 kilobytes. <laughs> Because then this this point where it gets better would be in, t- in the 2040s, mm-hmm. which is a little bit closer by. And that's nice because as long as people can decently r- use Bitcoin on a mobile phone, that is a vulnerability of the system because a lot of people don't have uh, desktop computers. Yep. And, you know, the longer we play in a situation where not everybody can run a full node, you know, that gives uh, governments or whatever the opportunity to capture the whole system. Yes. So we kind of want to you know, get into a place where Bitcoin is on everything, everywhere. Um, but it looks like that can't happen for the next hundred years or so because of these the choices that were made on how big blocks should be. Yes. So, so the argument that blocks are too big, I think, is a good argument. I don't think it's a sane plan to then reduce it to 300 kilobytes, but that's more of a political thing than a... Why don't you think it's sane? Because of the hard fork what, that would what, be necessary. What do you think? No, it would be a soft fork. Would it be? Yeah, so, so reducing the block size is a soft fork. So the way to look Increasing at it is... Increasing is a hard fork. Yes, and the way to look at that is is to say, if an old node saw a block that's 300 kilobytes, it'd be perfectly happy with it, um, right? Mm-hmm. If, however, an old node sees a block that is 4 megabytes, it would not be very happy with it. So making it smaller is a soft fork in that older nodes are not going to protest it. Mm-hmm. Uh, newer nodes, however, would reject blocks created by old nodes, because they would say, hey, this is bigger than uh, 300 kilobytes. That's on your limit. And so what? you could do it as a soft fork, and you could put a, a sunset on it. You could say, well, we're going to reduce it to 300 kilobytes, but only for the next 50 years. And after that, it jumps back. You can do all those things, but it'd be extremely controversial. Why would it be controversial? I don't know. I, I, mean, I think people would not be happy with the idea of you know, transactions getting a lot more expensive because of that. Yeah. It might also not be economically very efficient. I mean, it's not. It's probably not the case that if you make blocks infinitely small, that the total revenue for miners is going to go up. Or there's some optimum there, which uh, I'm not an economist, but at least I believe it's not the case that uh, that the monopoly rent is the highest rent. Well, economists aren't very good at predicting things anyway. So true. But I mean, the, the theoretical extreme is you could make blocks uh, uh, 10 kilobytes, for example, and then that would only be if quite a small number of transactions in every block. And that will probably make Bitcoin so useless 
that the miners would not be making money because nobody would be using Bitcoin. So there's some point at which you're making blocks too small to be useful. Mm -hmm. And then what do you think about... And also just agreeing on what the number would be. Like, can exactly. you imagine the arguments on Twitter and Reddit and GitHub? Should it be 300 kilobytes? Why not 369.420 kilobytes? Or, right. you know? uh, so just the bike shedding around that would be a nightmare. It would be because, again, you're introducing some arbitrary... You have to pick an arbitrary, arbitrary number. change, yeah. Yep. I mean, Satoshi was able to pick that one megabyte um, basically by himself very quickly and without telling anyone. Yeah, that, this happened early on, right? Yeah, so in the beginning, the blocks were, if you look at the code, I think they were effectively 32 megabytes, the very, very beginning. Then he probably realized that that's going to cause problems, given like the worst case size of the blocks and what, especially that old node software would definitely crash if it got blocks that were as big as the blocks are today, let alone if, the, if it was getting 32 megabyte blocks. It would just completely crash. So he probably realized that and just said, ah, I'll, I'll make it one megabyte. And well, that was the end of the discussion. It just happened. Well, that's interesting because then Satoshi set the precedent for an arbitrary change to... No, he, he, he basically did a bunch of arbitrary changes and that hopefully set the, pre uh, set the experience of like, we probably don't want this because some of these arbitrary changes could be very bad mm -hmm. if he was allowed to continue doing that. Yeah. And who knows that he might have talked to some people, but uh, I wasn't there, so. That's fascinating. Another thing you mentioned earlier, like just the the thought experiment you threw out there of thinking of Bitcoin in 50, the year 5300. That's another thing that really fascinates and thralls me about Bitcoin, the software project, and individuals who are like your like yourself who are working on it is a lot of you guys and girls have this like vision of working on Bitcoin today with the prospect of future humans many years after we're gone. I don't know if, if everybody's doing that all of the time. I'm definitely not doing that all of the time. No. Um, but it is, those are interesting thought experiments and it's, uh, for me, I'm a physicist by training, so it, it's also kind of a nice way to think about things. You extrapolate them to some extreme value and see if things still make sense. So you can, you know, if you look at, if you try to imagine what Bitcoin could look like in 10,000 years, you can see if there's some things you've, that just make no sense anymore, um, then something will have to be changed at some point to deal with that. Whereas if you only look two days in the future, you could say, well, who cares what we do because it's only two days in the future and it won't break in two days. Yeah. There is one hard fork that we do need, right? With the Unix timestamping. I believe so, yeah. I've been trying to raise the alarm bell around this. The alarm bell for something we need to do in 100 years. Well, the argument would be that you put in the hard fork flag in an earlier version so that, yes, we wait for 100 years to do that hard fork, but you have so many people have downloaded later versions of the software and it leads to as little disruption as possible. I may be wrong. Yeah, so if you look at the practical experience of running software that's more than 10 years old, like it hasn't been updated in 10 years, you're going to run into very a lot of problems, right? So mm -hmm. the experience suggests that when the year 2106 or whatever is arrives, nobody's going to be running software that was written before the year 2090. Nobody's going to be running version 0 0.24.1. No, because there simply won't be a computer then that can physically still run it. Mm -hmm. Like, you might not even be able to read it. Like, it'll just be a blob of, of bits and bytes, and it's like, what is this? Oh, that was Linux. You know, that existed so long ago, we have no idea what it is. That's interesting. Now I have an interest. So... So the idea, as you're suggesting, you, you want to put whatever that hard fork is going to be, you want to put it in the code early. Uh, at the same time, I, my you know, guesstimate would be do it 20 years in advance, mm -hmm. not 100, because there might be some other things you want to do, because mm -hmm. there is such a thing as the hard fork wish list. There's probably other things that might be useful to fix while you're at it that are not, hopefully not controversial. Um, yeah, but it'll, it'll still be interesting Yeah, because that will, might still create arguments. But the idea of having it in there 20 years in advance sounds useful, though. Yeah. This stoked a very interesting analogy in my head. Like the Bitcoin full node topology is similar to a human in its body in that like the cells I was born with, none of them exist to me right now. Mm -hmm. Like shed them and reproduce. Yeah, and none of the molecules do either. Yeah. And so like Bitcoin... The network is similar to that in a way. Yeah, I th I think so. Um, it de 
I mean, there will be a continuous history. Like you can, you can mm-hmm. process the whole history, and hopefully, the whole history would be preserved. Like I have memories. But you can even imagine a scenario where that's not the case. Where, if you know, if if this thing survived for thousands of years, and uh, maybe some wars happen, and maybe there is no backup of the whole history, and especially if you go to a situation where snapshots are used, because again, you cannot probably even with future computational power, not replay everything from the Genesis block at some point. Maybe that point is a thousand years away. Maybe that point is a million years away. But there's got to be, I think there's got to be a point where it, it just makes no sense anymore to try and replay everything from scratch. And then if the majority of people start using these snapshots, then may, maybe there will be a point where nobody will remember, even if there was ever a controversy. So that'll be very interesting. And yeah. there might be then conspiracy theories that there was a, uh, so let's say all the backups are gone. Like nobody has the Genesis block anymore, or maybe they have the Genesis block, but they don't have the blocks between the year uh, 25,367 and the, uh, you know, 26,000. And so they miss a thousand years worth of blocks. Nobody, nobody can find those blocks anymore. And so then the question is, is the last snapshot that we have from back then that the archaeologists have, is that really the start? Or was there some shenanigan in that 1,000 year period? And is that perhaps also why we don't have those transactions? Maybe somebody stole some Bitcoin, you know, forced everybody to go along with this change and buried all the evidence of it. And <laughs> that'll create some fascinating conspiracies. So we need a, a distributed library of Alexandria network. Yeah, you know what happened to the library of Alexandria, yeah, right? Well, that's why we need a distributed multiple secret, ideally. Yeah, but still, the, the longer the time period gets, the more difficult it will be to hold on to stuff. Yeah. And it's especially if somebody is dedicated to removing some piece of information. So I guess I haven't run the numbers on this, so I'm kind of making it up. Uh, I'm making the, thought that I'm, the part that I'm making up is that it is really, really hard to hold on to all of history. Um, but this depends on your assumptions of Moore's Law. I mean, with our current technology, I think it would be completely impossible on your Raspberry Pi to store a million years worth of blocks. It's hard to run a note on that Raspberry Pi right now. Yeah, but my guess is that in a million years, whatever computers will be there will be slightly better than a Raspberry Pi. Maybe not. Maybe we regress, right? Maybe we make a lot of technological process and then we have a bunch of wars and, and everybody goes back to the Stone Age and everybody is using, or not the Stone Age, but like maybe 200 years from now, everybody will be using Raspberry Pis again. And then we're really happy we didn't increase the block size, but we still can download the whole thing. And yeah. so we get to that sort of a bottleneck where... Maybe there's a the hard disk somewhere, <laughs> but then when people finally excavate the hard disk, it's just it doesn't work, doesn't work anymore. It's corrupted. Yeah, yeah. This is the most cosmic we've gotten on the show in a while. Oh. Uh, you're welcome. It's, it's fun to uh to think about this stuff. And you mentioned it. You come from a physics background. How did you come to find Bitcoin? Working on Bitcoin Core. Uh, this is what people do. No, uh, I mean, as a, after I. Th- I studied physics and then I did uh, sustainable development, which is sort of environmental science, looking at uh, climate change related stuff. But also um, my master thesis was on the migration patterns of ducks, which sounds completely random. It is completely random. But we had uh, duck, we have duck decoys in the Netherlands where they catch these, these ducks basically by, uh, they have a nice little pond and some little wood Wood, uh, wooden constructions and some cute little dogs and the, the ducks will see the cute little dog and they go towards it and then they kill it. And so they don't kill them anymore. But that was the way you would hunt ducks before you could shoot them down, um, basically. Um, but they now they put rings on it, so it's catch and release. So they put rings on it and then those ducks fly somewhere else and, and then some, some guy in Russia shoots down the duck and they find the ring and they know where to send it and that then you get a database of 100 years. And I analyzed that database and one of the things I did during that analysis was, was make a website called Ducks on Rails, which for the Ruby on Rails fans still get the pun. Um, <laughs> but basically it was a website where you could see that data visualized. The site is gone now. Um, but that was a software project. And then you go and travel a bit and you meet people at a barbecue and they say, can you write Python? It's like, well, I did something in Ruby on Rails. Sounds good. You're hired. <laughs> and so you become a software developer. And then as a software developer at some point, you come into contact with Bitcoin and you start applying your skills to Bitcoin. What drives? It's very serendipitous. What? Uh, but it, it did combine a lot of my interests even then. First of all, what did you learn from the duck migration study? That uh, they don't live very long. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, it's very nice that the Dutch don't hunt the ducks, but it's kind of pointless because the Finns and the Russians shoot them all down. <laughs> um, 
Uh, lot, they're breeding enough. There's a lot of duck hunting here in Texas too. Yeah, but those are not coming from Europe. No. As far as at least uh, the species I looked at in that limited database that I had, which is like a hundred years of, of data, so it's kind of fun to look at. Uh, most of them fly sort of northeast towards Siberia. Um, I don't think a lot of them fly to America, which kind of makes sense if you look at the history, because we know that only once the Europeans started going to America, that's when a lot of people started dying here from all the European diseases. And if there had been lots of duck migration towards the Americas, that should have happened earlier, because pretty much everything we have, you know, we, we give it to ducks and it flies yeah, over. So... Um, I didn't learn anything specific. I did learn that people had historically had horrible habits of how to maintain databases. Uh, <laughs> there have been different coordinate systems that people use. Um, so the Netherlands had its own coordinate system different from the GPS coordinates that we're used to. Um, and then because records were kept on paper, people would write down one, two, three, four, five, six if they didn't know the coordinate. But that's not fun if you're using a computer to process it because one, two, three, four, five, six is an actual place. So it's like, why are all these ducks in this weird village? I was like, oh, okay. So, yeah, but nothing profound. Yeah. Fascinating. And then you got into contact with Bitcoin. What drew you into Bitcoin and wanted you? I mean, I had some um, experience. It's a friend of mine who was very much into gold. So I was kind of following people like Peter Schiff at the time, um, have read some of the stuff. I was not, I would not consider myself a fanatical gold bug, but I was definitely interested. And I, what I liked about some of them things is that they were asking good questions about the current financial system. And even if I didn't always agree with the answers they would give about how good gold would be as a solution, I, I did think they asked good questions about like how you're going to manage things like inflation and how much can you borrow. And I found the official answers to be very unsatisfying because the official answer, I think, it's still summarized as YOLO, basically. <laughs> it's like, uh, like, yeah, no, these deaths will be fine. And I must say, I, I then I'm always surprised that the whole thing doesn't collapse as yeah. bad as you think it should. And after 20 years of hearing these stories, you're like, yeah, well, it still hasn't collapsed, so maybe I'm missing something. But whatever, that drew my interest. Then I'm a software developer, and Bitcoin is programmable money. So once I understood that, I was very much interested in it. Because it is, like I said, it's software. And because it's money, as soon as you buy like 10 euros of the stuff and it's in your own wallet and you can change the code of your own wallet, now that just, I don't know, that adds a lot of extra motivation because now it's something you can lose and, yeah. So you received Bitcoin for the first time and then like made a custom wallet for it? Not a custom wallet. I, I bought some like tiny amount on a uh, one Bitonic, I think it was. It's a Dutch uh, Dutch broker. They've been around since 2011, 2012 or something. It was a bit later. Then I sent it to the blockchain.com wallet, which at the time, blockchain.info at the time. And that this was right when they were banned from the App Store. And uh, so there was all these cool videos of people shooting their iPhones. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember uh, that. Yeah, that was very cool. And so, but I was an iOS developer. So even though it wasn't in the App Store, I was able to just download the app, the source code, because it was open source, I was able to compile it and run it on my phone. So that was one of the first things I did was just to try and get that app to work on my own phone and then find some bugs in it. Um, because that's what you do as an open source developer, you you make a bug report, that got ignored for a year. And then a year later, they actually called me to work for them. So that's why I worked for them for a couple of years. What was it like building out blockchain.info? Yeah, it was very fun. It was especially because it was during a bear market. So I don't know if what would have happened otherwise, because this is like 2014 to 2017 to early 2017. So everybody, I think, would have thought Bitcoin was dead. But you don't have to worry about that because you just focused on, at the time, we were rewriting the whole wallet software from the thing that was written by just one guy. Um, ben Reeves basically wrote the original wallet and we, with a couple of people helped rebuild it. And I think they've since rebuilt it again since I left, but that's what software development is. So you're just busy enough just figure out how do you make a non-custodial wallet basically in a browser and all the, the trade-offs there. What? So yeah, I, th I had a great time there. What were some of like the most important lessons you learned? Well, long-term, I don't like building, I don't like having a wallet in the browser and it has mostly to do not so much with the fact that it's a browser, but the fact that it's, that the only thing you can build it in is JavaScript and the only good system to build JavaScript is Node.js. And Node.js is a dependency circus. Mm -hmm. And so a dependency circus means like you want to um, 
do some sort of nice graphic in your browser, great, you have this little package. And this little package will use some other, 10 other packages. And that those 10 other packages will use 10 other packages. So now the problem is, if you want to make sure there's no backdoor coming into you, you have to keep an eye on the ten, on maybe 10,000 different packages. And that problem is very hard to solve. I think there, there, there have always been some efforts to solve it, but it's, I don't think it's still unsolved. Yeah. And so one of the things I liked about Bitcoin Core as a project is it has very few dependencies so in the order of 10, probably. And you write about in the book, the Geeks Project is trying to create reproducible builds. So. Yes, because although Bitcoin Core itself has very few dependencies, you still have to compile Bitcoin Core. And that is where the the rabbit hole that Carl Dong, uh, Carl Dong opened in one of his talks is is huge and scary because in order to build it, well, you need an operating system and a compiler, and that itself is a lot of different moving parts that could have backdoors in it. And so there was a solution already for designed, I think, with Bitcoin in mind and with the Tor browser in mind called um, a Gitian. Mm-hmm. And Gitian basically meant like you take a you take an Ubuntu disk from 2000, I don't know, 2015 or whatever, some older version of Ubuntu, which comes with a compiler and because you know the image, the hash of the image of the disk uh, when you download a, an ISO image or something. So at least you know exactly what you're starting with and then you do a bunch of magic and then you build Bitcoin Core and the idea, the goal of it is to say, I guess that's more important to say, the goal is given the source code of Bitcoin that you can find on GitHub, this thing that you're downloading, how do you prove that these are related? Because I can show you an open source project and show you some beautiful source code and then I'm going to send you a file, which is compiled source code, a binary, which could be completely different. And in particular, it could steal all your coins. So that's what uh, Gideon at the time and now Geeks tries to solve. And Geeks, I think, is, the very, is a very cool project in that it, it tries to build a whole operating system from scratch, from source. So you, you start with, um, I think... I don't know if they've really gotten there, but that's their ambition. The idea is they started with maybe 60 bytes or some really short thing that is binary, that is something a computer can run, but it's so short that you can actually read it. So you can you can take it, you can write it down, and you can look at what these instructions are doing. So it is kind of source, even though it's also a binary, right? Because a computer, when it runs a program, it just receives a bunch of instructions, like add this number to this number, uh, do this thing on your memory, etc. Uh, so you start with those 60 bytes, and then those 60 bytes are just enough so that you, the next part of the thing you can give it is text, mm-hmm. and it can uh, so it's able to read text. And text means you can write sort of human readable source code in a very very primitive language. And so you, but at least that's easier to inspect for the person. You don't have to look, don't have to look at the bytes anymore. You can now look at a piece of text, even though that's still very primitive programming language. And that piece of text gets run, or gets turned, yeah, yeah, gets parsed by that first magical bytes. And that piece of text is enough information for the computer to build a more sophisticated compiler that can read more complicated instructions from a human. And so it's a compiler building a compiler, building a compiler, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until finally you have a modern, you have the full modern uh, C++ compiler that you can then use to compile Bitcoin Core or any other project. So is it similar to the Merkle tree example that we were using earlier, where since you have that short text that you start up with, you know for sure that when you get a full C++ compiler at the end... It's, it's not it, a Merkle tree, but it is because you start with a short piece of text. Mm-hmm. Every th- step along the way will be some piece of code. Mm-hmm. So it, you're not trusting a big piece of binary. You're always looking at code. And as long as you inspect all these intermediate pieces of code... Then you can be sure that it's not doing anything weird. It can only produce what you expect, or well, via so, this so, way, it so, only produces what you expect to produce. Is it, that it removes the? Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily phrase it like that, but the idea is that um, you can show that given the piece of source that you started with, so a piece of human readable code like the Bitcoin Core code, mm-hmm. given that code, this binary that you're getting actually comes from that code. Okay. And there's no shenanigans going on in the middle. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think Carl Dong in his presentation showed like what could go wrong if you don't do that. And there were things like the the, the compiler would just add some 
Nazi insults or something in your code, even though you didn't put them in your code, but they would be in the end product. And then you would try removing the compiler and it would still do it because the thing went somewhere else and it was just really weird. But here you can now, you can follow it all the way from the beginning. You can inspect every step along the way to make sure that this thing is going to produce correct code. And of course, not everybody's going to do that, but that's okay because you have all these hashes out there that say this is what was used to build it. And you can later go back in time and look at you know what that hash represented and look at all the code, underlying code. And if some shenanigan does happen, there'll be a nice record and you can find out where the shenanigan was. Mm -hmm. And then at least it won't happen again. Yes. And if a few people do like a Geeks reproducible build, start up a Bitcoin core, everybody uses that binary should. Not everybody, but you have some sense of comfortability that it does what you think it's going to do. Yeah, so the idea there is, um, so there's two different threats that you're worried about. What Geeks is really worried about is not so much the Bitcoin core developers being evil, but the, the person making the compiler could be evil, right? But what you're usually doing when you're just downloading Bitcoin core is you, at least you want to make sure that the Bitcoin core developers didn't give you some malware that they really gave you what was in the source code. And so how much confidence you need for that, I don't know, but at least, uh, you know, there are Bitcoin core devs that are signing sort of testifying that they started with the source code and got this particular binary file. Then if it turns out that binary file has malware in it, at least you can prove that there was some sort of collusion or something some malicious bad action. going on. Yeah. But obviously it could still happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, then the question is, uh, so there's multiple people who can sign this. It can be developers, but anyone can come in and do this Geeks build. So maybe you do a Geeks build and then 20 of your friends who trust you we'll see, okay, Marty's signature is there. So Marty actually checked that this source code leads to this binary. And I don't know who these core devs are, but I know Marty. So I'll, I'll use that as, as enough trust that I'll be willing to run that binary without compiling it myself. Mm -hmm. Of course, anybody can still go and compile it themselves, but that's just more work. Yes. But the system relies, I think, mostly on, on somebody ringing the alarm bell. So it's much, mostly about transparency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shout out to Carl. Which which can be a reason to say, I'm just going to download the new release, and I'm just going to sit on it for like a month or two, see if the nobody raises the alarm bell, and then I'll run it. Yeah. Yeah, if you freaks want to dive deep into geeks, Carl came on the show. Gosh, it has to be like two years ago now. Probably. Uh, he also did a, a quick talk at Breaking Bitcoin in Amsterdam in 2019. Mm -hmm. That video is on YouTube too. It's just 20 minutes, and that 20-minute talk will give you nightmares. <laughs> Yeah, Carl's one of the, he's taking a break right now, right? Could be, I don't know. Yeah, I think he announced. Um, yeah, it's interesting. All this stuff is fascinating. And the rabbit hole goes deeper because there is also the hardware uh, oh, yes. that you're running on in general, and that is almost unsolved, like backdoors and chips and that sort of stuff. It's, we don't really well, know what to do about it. That's what uh, Warren Tagami gave a talk at. Riga this year, uh, Baltic Honey Badger, basically explaining like, hey, <laughs> probably shouldn't be using Raspberry Pis to download a news core. If too many people use Raspberry Pis and, and Raspberry Pis only business model becomes selling Bitcoin notes, then I guess the incentives are pretty scary. Yeah. Yes, and Raspberry Pi I think is also not very is not entirely open source. Uh, I think it's fine that people use it to run a node. I just think they should probably keep their coins on some other thing. Mm -hmm. Then you know, if you use a hardware wallet in combination with the Node and Raspberry Pi, then you you probably could be fine. Yeah. And then of course, if you want to upgrade, yeah, sure. Then maybe try some other hardware. Yeah. But in fact, you can run a Node on your normal computer. You don't need a Raspberry Pi to run a Node. Exactly. It's just if you want to have it on twenty four seven, then I guess it's nice to have those. You don't have to keep your Node on twenty four seven. If no. you're using Lightning, it's a different story. But if you're just using Bitcoin on chain, you can just open your laptop, sync the blockchain. And Whenever you need to sync it and then close it again. Yeah, it'll take a few minutes. If Yeah, and you can prune it, which means you don't have to store the whole 600 gigabytes. You just store like 10 gigabytes. It's not going to take up that much space. It's smaller than most of your computer games probably. However, you don't want to keep your funds on that laptop, at least not the ones that you're not willing to lose. No, probably. Because you're going to have other stuff on your laptop, and that might have a, some malware on it Yeah, that knows where to look. So you run a, if you're trying to save space... Download Bitcoin Core, prune your node, download something like Sparrow, and then interact with your node using Sparrow on a hardware wallet. 
You can even use Core directly with a hardware wallet. Yes. It does take a little bit more skill. Shout out so, to uh, to Andrew Chow. Yep, Andrew Chow for HWI. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would definitely start with maybe one of those easier to use tools to get your hands dirty. And then, but again, it's about how many dependencies do you want to install? Mm -hmm. like how many? How much stuff do you want to install that touches your Bitcoin? And that I don't know if Sparrow has a lot of dependencies itself, but it is again a piece of software that you have to download. Yeah. Uh, so is HWI. So you, you know. You can, but Sparrow is probably bigger. So ultimately, okay. I'd like to be able to just download Bitcoin Core and, and then Interact have that them. work with hardware wallets directly. But the usability f difference is significant enough, especially if you're new. Yes. I'm just trying to think of like uh, ways you can mitigate loss of funds, right? Especially if you're sending them. Uh, use your node. Sparrow, maybe. Hardware wallet to prove receive Bitcoin to a particular address and if you're sending maybe triple check Sparrow your hardware wallet and the address that's being presented to you yeah the, of course you know if the malware on your computer is sophisticated enough then the website that you're going to well it'll you. it'll mess with your browser to make the website show a different address so now you're checking the website and you're checking your hardware wallet and it says the same thing but it's really going to the person attacking you Mm -hmm. um, of course, that would take some very, very sophisticated hardware wallet. But if you're Michael Saylor, that is something you want to be worried about. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> if you're not, then maybe not, unless it's somebody already built it and made it general purpose. But then you probably know about it. Yeah. Speaking of like Bitcoin Core and using the Bitcoin Core GUI to do all of this, what's the status of uh, Rostyanovsky's separation of... The, the wallet and the node software, and not just Russ, but others who are helping him out with that. Ongoing. He is like uh, the the, uh, the living example of patience. Mm -hmm. um, he I mean, a lot of the, the work has been merged into it, but he has also things, pull requests that are open and have been open for many, many years. Um, part of what does happen is that bits of his pull requests get chipped off and put into Bitcoin Core like incrementally. And that process just takes time. Depends on how many people have time to review it, mm -hmm. um, which not a lot of people do. But it it'll get there eventually. Yeah. I think everybody agrees that it's a good idea to separate it. Yeah. And so, f for anybody that's unaware, what's the problem? Well, the problem in general is that Bitcoin Core is a very big monolithic piece of software, and that's never a healthy thing. So he's trying to split it into little pieces, and that could also have security benefits. Let's say there is a Say you run your node. So you have Bitcoin Core as a node, but also a wallet. Right? And the wallet's holding on to your private keys. But let's say there's some security vulnerability, security vulnerability in the node part of the software. Then hopefully that somebody could, could attack your node and then steal the coins from your wallet. This type of separation might make it so that there's an extra line of defense where, yeah, you've compromised the node part of the software, you haven't compromised the wallet. Other UI things could be that maybe you you have a desktop computer and you want to have Bitcoin run in the background. So you'll have the node run in the background, but not uh, the, the GUI stuff. And so then if you want to interact with the Bitcoin core stuff, you would launch the GUI separately and it would just connect to the node that's already running. Hmm. Or maybe you have a laptop with the Bitcoin desktop on it, but your node is running on your Raspberry Pi in the basement. So now you can connect from your laptop to your node that's running on the a desktop, all that sort of stuff can be done with the kind of separation that he's working on. Another thing that could be useful is to create alternative wallets that are first-class citizens. So currently, um, the if you have a wallet, say like Spectre Desktop or uh, Sparrow, they can connect to Bitcoin Core, but there's a limit of things they can do. Mm -hmm. So they're not they're not first class citizens, and the Bitcoin Core wallet itself has complete privileged access to the Bitcoin Core node. It can do more. It it's generally just a bit nicer experience, and that's not because Bitcoin Core developers are mean and anti competitive. It is just because uh, the way that the Bitcoin Core wallet connects to the rest of the Bitcoin Core node is like spaghetti tangled very tightly, and so what Russ is doing is slowly separating these things out, so that at some point you could plug in any any wallet software and it will have the same ability to use the node as the regular Bitcoin Core wallet, which should speed up people building better wallet software. That would be pretty incredible. Yeah, and, and ultimately I could even imagine somebody building an equivalent Bitcoin Core wallet 
at least the or at least probably not the wallet. The wallet is fine. It's the it's the GUI, the UI that's not very pretty. But it's the same story. The Bitcoin Core UI is very tightly coupled to the node. But somebody and right now, if you want to make the UI nicer, it's very difficult to make any changes to it because part of it because the software that is built in is not super easy to develop on the Qt. But also because any change you're making now, you know, you're you're touching the Bitcoin Core project, so it has to have a lot of scrutiny. And then you make a design change and people have opinions about it and it just gets it's very slow to make any UI improvements to Bitcoin Core. But with this separation in place, somebody can make a drop-in replacement for the UI that will have the exact same access to Bitcoin itself, so it will feel just as smooth or not smooth. And then once that replacement, once people start using that replacement, it gets very popular. Let's say, you know, the Sparrow of, of Bitcoin Core GUIs or something becomes really popular. Then Bitcoin Core could at some point simply swap them out, like just toss the old code and put in the new code after it's gone through the necessary inspection. So I think it'll, it'll be a more competitive or potentially more competitive system where you could have alternative uh, graphical interfaces and, and have them not have them not have one of them be at a disadvantage yeah so this that's all very promising but also it's very it's not there's nothing on fire so it just it's not a priority well i mean if if you're doing review from day to day what are you going to review right are you going to review this this thing that just crashed or this fancy shiny little feature or this very abstract uh very in, important but very abstract and complicated 10,000 line uh, pull request and yeah the answer is the former mostly <laughs> shout out to Russ though it's a heroic yep. effort it's been ongoing for many years I got the t-shirt though I got the uh, because I once once or twice did review some of his work and then uh, Chaincode Labs will give you a uh, Ack Russ t-shirt <laughs> really so yep <laughs> I got one of those uh, what as you might have mentioned it but what area of core have you been reviewing mostly these days I think I mostly hang out in the wallet, mm -hmm. uh, but I did recently also test the uh, the new change by uh, Suhas uh, to make the headers yeah and and SIPA, um, to change the way the headers are downloaded the first time because I thought that was a very cool change. Um, so I I can be all over the code base, but I'm mostly in the wallet and then mostly reviewing things that I think will long term make uh, hardware wallet use easier. That could be anything from mini script, though I haven't reviewed that much, to a lot of just the under the hood refactoring of the wallet that mostly Andrew Chow is doing. So just doesn't give you any new features, but it will make the wallet better. Mm -hmm. uh, or adding Taproot, which does make it better. That's funny you mentioned mini script. I'd um, somebody who's been playing around with mini script and going on a public campaign to get hardware wallets to implement it and other Excellent. wallet softwares. What what is the benefit of mini script? What is it? enable users to do so what miniscript is is essentially the bitcoin script itself is very dangerous so it is very easy to write a smart contract in bitcoin well it's a smart contract not even scare quotes you can write a smart contract in bitcoin that you think what it's going to do is it'll give you a signature and it'll give uh, some company that you trust the other signature um, so that you both have to sign in order to spend so they can you know protect you against uh, uh, duress or something like that but then there's a timeout that you will get your coins back at the end of that period. Uh, but what it actually does is it just throws all your money away uh, because you made a mistake in, in writing your Bitcoin script by hand because Bitcoin script is very, very hard to write safely. And so what people like Andrew Polster have been doing is, is looking at Bitcoin script and trying to sort of salvage, I would almost call it salvage pieces of that Bitcoin script that are safe. So ignoring most of it, just taking little bits of Bitcoin script that are safe and then specifying precisely how you can use those little bits of script, in a, like how you can combine them in a way that any combination you make is also safe. And then the next step is they build a bunch of automation on top of that, a compiler essentially that says, okay, you don't have to write that script yourself. Just tell us what you want to do. For example, you want to have this system where two people can sign and after one year, the third person can sign and give us a little bit more extra information. For example, you might say 99% of the time we're both going to sign. This fallback condition is only going to happen once once in a blue moon. And then the compiler will say, fine, I'm going to then give you a piece of script. This is your Bitcoin script. And that Bitcoin script 
uh, can be written as Miniscript or as Bitcoin script. So you can go both ways. Yeah. And the, the reason the percentages play a role is it might optimize for fees. Mm -hmm. So first they will find the, a way, there's many ways to do the same, to reach the same goal of having two signatures. You could have, uh, there's an operation called uh, op multisig, I think it's called, where the op multisig says, okay, you say op multisig and then you add two signatures, but you can also do, you can also just have two signature checks in a row that say, just do two signature checks. And then the question is, which of those two is better? And by better, it could mean what is cheapest to spend. Mm -hmm. And what is cheapest to spend depends on, um, could depend on what the chances are. So so your fallback, you might, your compiler might say, well, this fallback condition is rare, so it is very expensive to use, but most of the time you won't use it anyway. And by default, you'll you'll spend very little in fees. So that's what the compiler does for Miniscript. Mm -hmm. So it's very cool if that's useful, if, if that works, because it allows you to, to more easily make more complicated spending conditions. And also it allows you to abstract things away. So for example, in the example with the company that helps you custody your own funds, uh, right now the way that will probably work is a very simple multisig, where they just have a signature in the multisig, because that's something you can inspect. But with Miniscript, what you can do is you can say, it's a one of two, oh, sorry, it's a two of two, so we both need to sign. And my part as a simple user is just one signature, but the, the company has a giantly complicated internal accounting system with, you know, they have themselves three different signatures and whatever they want to do. And I don't care about any of that. It'll, you'll, you look at the mini script and it'll show you two brackets and anything between those brackets. I don't care what's in those brackets. I, I just know that's what the other side can do, but I can, I know what I can do. So it allows you to basically, yeah, you, yeah, you can make things even more complicated. Mm -hmm in a way that you can still verify that you're not being uh, screwed over. Yeah. So somebody like Unchained could implement this. Yeah, exactly. Because now Unchained can only give you probably a simple signature um, or alternatively, they can give you a very complicated script that does all the safety checks on their end, but you have no idea what this thing is doing and if you can still access your coins because you now need to reason about the script they give you, mm -hmm. right? Because they'll generate an address probably and that's the address where you're sending your coins to, but that address represents a script. And so you'll have, to, and, and they'll give you the script presumably too, otherwise that'd be weird. Um, but you then need to look at that script and say, okay, if I send coins to this address, am I ever going to get that back? Under what conditions am I going to get that back? And Miniscript allows you to analyze that. Seems no, pretty. No matter how complicated it is, basically. Seems yeah. pretty useful. Yeah, I think so. But it, it, it is definitely one of those sort of futuristic projects. And then, yeah, it'd be great if more hardware wallets support it. Um, there's also still a need to make this script, the standard compatible with Taproot, which is a whole new kind of worms <laughs> take, to take advantage of Taproot. Yeah. So, I mean, we're just diving down all the rabbit holes. It's like there's a lot of work in progress. Yes. <laughs> Sorry for the pun. Good, good, bu good book plug. Um, what is the state of Taproot? I've heard. It's dead. That's what Udi <laughs> says. Is it dead? No, it's not dead. No, it's deployed. The thing is, the the blockchain understands what Taproot is. Mm -hmm. It can it can process very complicated Taproot scripts just fine. Um, I believe this was recently demonstrated by um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Barack. Barack, exactly. By breaking Lightning with a very complicated Taproot transaction twice. Twice. Um, it it works. The thing is. Um, to actually use those features, you need to have wallet software that can use those features. And that's simply where all the work is. So until people write wallet software that does that actually takes advantage of what is possible, the adoption of Taproot would be relatively low. Because the, the most basic version of Taproot, where it's just a single signature and you can spend from the single signature, that has almost no advantage over SegWit by itself. So there's not that much reason to adopt it. You could. I mean, the main value prop for adopting Taproot right now is particularly for users leveraging multisig who would like <clears throat> the uh, the input to look like a single sig. Address. Yeah, but the software for that, I don't think it exists yet, other yeah. than an experimental state. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because in order to write the software, you need to have some sort of standard that you implement into the software. And, and 
the the standards themselves are only fairly new. So there's music, music two, mm. those I think are the most recent standards. But then you know, you want to review all that yourself, or I'm not a cartographer, <laughs> so you're saying it takes time. Yeah, and I don't think there's a pull request yet to get music into Bitcoin Core even. Interesting. So this is the thing: the the Bitcoin blockchain, like Bitcoin Core, can check if a given music signature is correct, but because it won't even know that it's a music signature. Music signatures don't look any different than normal signatures, and that's all well and well and good. But somebody will actually have to implement that stuff, and then combine that with Miniscript, right? So then your your compiler would say, okay, normally it's going to be this 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 combined signature that you and and uh, the company you work with produce and it'll look like any other transaction but if something goes wrong then you're going to use uh the the hidden script that's inside taproot that's inside the the tap tree i guess uh to spend it and what does that script look like yeah again so, so just just a lot of tooling that still needs to be made so i, I yeah this this a lot well that's why it's interesting that's why i'm sitting here with this look just throughout this whole conversation we've dove down a bunch of different rabbit holes utrexo early geeks taproot mini script music what russ is trying to do with the separation of the wallet and the node like, do you think there's a point at which the project gets what some would deem spread too thin and there's just so much going on and there's not enough sort of narrow focus well arguably it is spread too thin but the thing is it is a anarchist collective of developers essentially right. Everybody can work on whatever they want to work on. Anybody can review whatever they want to review. Mm -hmm. So if there's just a lot of different people, a lot of different things people are interested in, then there'll be a lot of different things that don't move very quickly. Yeah. Is that good or bad? Or it just is? It just is. Yeah. <laughs> there's nothing. Yeah, it just is. I mean, uh, if, if more developers show up, that could help. Uh, more people to test the things that are out there. Uh, but other than that, you know, you just have, if two people have cool ideas, then if they decide to review each other's work, that'll help. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, do you think, I mean, that's always been a big beam. Developers don't want to work on Bitcoin. It's too boring. It's too slow. Well, that's why I wrote the book saying, it's like, oh, despite all the marketing, there's lots of interesting things. Like we just went in like 10 different rabbit holes that just don't sound as, sound as exciting as NFT marketplace, <laughs> I guess. Um, but they are all of them are interesting projects and all of them can use help from developers that are interested in helping. Um, so let's get into the book. I mean, obviously you decided to write it to, we've covered everything to highlight all these, but no, it started out as a podcast, correct? It still is a podcast. So there's yes. a podcast that uh, used to be called the uh, Van Weirdum Shores NATO. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think Odell complained that uh, it was a bit hard to pronounce for people. <laughs> <laughs> and also that like, if you told them, you got to listen to the Van Weirdum Shores NATO podcast, we were like, what do I type? <laughs> um, so it was rebranded to a Bitcoin explained, which is it's much easy. easier. Yes, with a comma. But the uh, so basically every well in the beginning every week, later every other week or so, we record me and Aaron van Weerdum, uh record a about thirty minute episode where we pick a technical topic in Bitcoin and we explain it fairly quickly. There's no politics. It's just um, yeah, it's pretty short. And at some point, somebody suggested to me, hey, you should write a book in general. Like this was a talk where somebody said, everybody should write a book, which I think is true. And then gave a couple of suggestions of what you could use to make a book. And I think one of them was to look at your podcast. But so what I did was to take a couple of the episodes, I guess my favorites at the time, and get somebody to write a transcript or some, let's say ref.com, for example, they, they'll give you a, a human human power transcript you don't want to use computers and then i hired an editor in berlin who helped me uh take these transcripts and turn them from a dialogue into a monologue and of course shorten it and then ask lots of questions and uh, she is she is a somebody who is used to editing technical books developer books but not a bitcoiner which is very useful because then she would ask lots of questions like what what do you mean by this you know what's a taproot or that sort of stuff. And I would answer those questions and we would collaborate on GitHub. So the whole book is basically a GitHub open, it's an open source project too, but on GitHub there would just be a piece of text and then she would make a pull request with the new version of the text and I would simply 
uh, I could add things myself to the pull request, so I could just take my own answers and add them like right into the text. So it's a lot of back and forth. Uh, whereas my understanding is that normally when people edit books, they just write the whole thing and throw it over the wall. <laughs> this was far more interactive. It's almost like writing code the way you'd write a book. So one chapter would take about three times back and forth with lots of questions, and then that chapter would be done, and then you just do the next one and the next one. Seems like a really cool way to write a book. I like the I like the the, the workflow. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like this could be a series of books. Yeah, I, I thought about that. So one thing I could do, and I don't know yet, is to just write part two and just pick another bunch of episodes and, and, and make it a Bitcoin even more work in progress, something like that. The other thing I can do is just add more chapters to the existing book and make it a new edition. Uh, I will do neither until I find a way to make more money with the book because it hasn't sold enough copies to justify that amount of work. But in principle, it, it makes sense. Yeah. Go buy the book, freaks. Where can we find it? Anywhere. No, uh, definitely on Amazon, but most of these online bookstores will have it. If you type something like Shores Bitcoin or Bitcoin Work in Progress, you'll, you'll probably find it too. Um, if you, I prefer people get the physical version, hence, hence things like Amazon, because I think it'll be more robust against time to have this thing physically lying in some attic in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there is also an ebook, uh, but it also I think it looks nicer on paper. Uh, there's also an ebook that you can even get from my own website. Uh, it's btcwip, so workinprogress.com. And it'll link to Amazon, but also link to the ebook version. I mean, this is a beautiful cover as well. It's very clean. Thank you. It's a, it's a photo I took in. Um, oh, you took the photo? Yes. I'll hold it up too for the camera. And it's actually, the newer versions are not transparent, so I made them uh, opaque. Okay. This is slightly older print. The, this is a building in Shenzhen, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. While it was under construction in 2011, I was just kind of randomly walking through Shenzhen and was like, this is a cool building. So I took some photos and then I needed a cover. It's an interim cover, but I thought, this is kind of cool. It's a pretty good interim cover. Thanks. With thousands of crypto projects out there, they say Bitcoin is old and boring, but nothing could be further from the truth. This book will guide you through the le latest developments in Bitcoin as seen through the eyes of one of its many developers. Yep. First paragraph of the uh, the back cover. Thank you for writing it. I You're welcome. I was telling you yesterday we need to get a bunch uh, here in the comments to give out. Yeah, I'll I'll try to get uh, one or two here. We should. We, we, we'll talk about it. We've got okay. a budget. We should we should just bulk buy a bunch. That's fine too. Yeah. Support Shores. I do want you to write more books because again, I think this info. Yeah, I think I've talked to some people who, who read it and really liked it. So that's that's always very encouraging. It's also kind of fun uh, when people, random people you don't know, approach you at a conference and say, yeah, I read your book and I liked it. It was a very strange uh, sensation. Yeah. I've had, uh, speaking of, you said like a person who convinced you to write the book said everybody should write a book. I've had a lot of people saying I should write a book. Um, yeah, no, a lot of people don't think they have anything to write about and that's kind of her point. Uh, that you probably should have a book, if only because it's a good business card. So it's, it's like a conversation starter or, yeah, you can show it off. I wrote a book. Uh, you don't make money with books, at least almost never. There are some people who do. Uh, there are some business models that you can do for, for publishing, though I think those people generally even outsource the, even the writing of it, just like lots and lots of content for, for certain issues. Yeah, are the AIs going to start writing all the books? I wouldn't want to read those. Would you even know if you were? Yes. You would? Have you ever like Googled something like I need a new kettle or like, a, or I need a new headphones that are noise canceling or my Instagram doesn't let me post a photo. Every first 10, 20 hits on Google are going to be these super SEO optimized pieces of content. Like it'll start with, so it's very annoying when you cannot post on Instagram. Yes, that's feeling that Instagram is broken. Like they, they use all the they re, use all the phrases that are used to get SEO optimized, and that's done by humans, and it's super obvious. And I'm pretty sure the AI will be just as obvious because it will try to write content that is attractive to Google. So I just would not recommend if you do that to use Google itself to generate the content that way because <laughs> they'll probably keep a log and they'll just ban you. <laughs> That's what I would do if I was Google. And maybe this is actually a honeypot by Google to catch all these SEO people. Ah. To like see if they start using Google itself to produce the SEO content. And then it's trivial to just you know plug all the networks, especially all the, the links between those networks. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah the affiliate link game. Yeah, so no, I would not read a book written by an AI, probably. Okay. I hope not to, too. I don't know if I'd be I mean, enough I, to I'm discern. not opposed. Like, if the AI actually writes a book that's as good as a human, I'm happy with it. I just don't think it will. Oh. I think it'll write a lot of text that sounds similar to things you've heard before. Yeah. Because that's what it uses to write. Yeah. So you're saying human creativity is not going away anytime soon? I don't know if the creativity is the word. I mean, the, the thing that the computer is doing is not, like thinking in the way we do so a book that's trying to explain something it's just if it's just regurgitating words then just tell me where you got the words from and i'll read the book that you're citing <laughs> right it's like you'll you'll get something that may sound similar to shakespeare but it'll just be a completely nonsensical story where things just happen randomly out of order and they sound very poetic there's a lot of plot holes and yeah there probably won't be a plot <laughs> It'll just, yeah, it'll just be all sorts of cliches in a row. Yeah. Um, the room was warm and green. <laughs> there was a girl and a boy. And then the robots took over. Yeah, it'll just, <laughs> it'll just be gibberish. Uh, so I'm not saying that will never happen in the very far future, but so far, yeah, my impression of the AI stuff is it's, it's doing a lot of circus tricks that mm -hmm. can be very useful for very specific things, but not really. You think it's going to help people code better? I don't know. It might, because it's kind of like a very elaborate autocomplete. You know, if you're writing code, it's nice that you you write one word and it'll sort of add a bunch of structure. So even without even without AI, a piece of code might say, if um, the first letter of the word is A, well, then maybe I intend to write also if the first letter of the word is B, or if the first letter is C. So it's nice if you hit enter and it'll just, put all the letters of the alphabet in there and then I just have to write what it actually does, you know, when that happens. So I think AI could be able to, to do that. It can try to extrapolate what you're probably trying to do. Mm -hmm. I don't think it will make you write better code. It'll just, you know, make you write the code a little bit quicker. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the time you are just going on Google and like asking like, oh, what is this? How do I do this again? How do I do that again? And I think some of that could probably the computer could help you with that. Yeah. It wouldn't necessarily understand what you're trying to do. It would just say that people in your situation usually want this and then do it for you. Yeah. Which may at the end of the day make you write better. But code any code time. that the computer can completely anticipate means you're writing too much code. Because <laughs> then it sounds like you should just write the shorter instruction and then let the computer turn it into something bigger. Uh, just like when you write code, the computer will eventually create machine language. Um, but your the thing you're writing in code should be the shortest way to express what you're trying to do. To a computer if there's a shorter way to express it then you've just invented a higher level programming language that will let you do things in less words uh -huh. which is nice um i don't think you need ai for that no fascinating we've had all the rabbit holes in this episode there's probably some left yeah <laughs> what uh what haven't we touched that's on top of your mind sorry what haven't we touched on that's on top of your mind in regards to bitcoin or any um, other trends no, I don't, I don't have much. What happened with the uh, Bitcoin War Core version 0.24.0? What was the bug that got quickly patched? Oh, yeah. Uh, apparently, there was a coin selection bug. Like, if you, I think if you selected some coins, it would do something really badly, really wrong, and make you spend too much money on fees. But I don't know the specifics of the bug. Mm -hmm. uh, just that it wasn't, like, I think the release was announced, but if you went to BitcoinCore.org, you couldn't download it yet. And so hopefully not too many people got that version. Okay. And if they, yeah. But if you do have that version, please install the actual 24.0.1. Yes. Because it won't have that bug. What were the major updates with this? In 24? With 24 without the bugs. Uh, well, there was the RBF thing. That is a setting. Oh, that, yeah. That that's going to cause a lot of drama. Yeah. But that setting is off by default. So in, in principle, nothing changes if you update um, there is one thing that I think is very cool is a new way to sync headers. So the first time your node starts, it'll uh, first ask its peers for headers and then it'll ask it for blocks. And the way that's done is changed completely under the hood. And that'll eventually allow us to get rid of checkpoints. And the checkpoints are kind of a, like ugly thing that are still left out from the old days. Mm -hmm. um, Deep in the chain. There's only like, how many checkpoints are yeah, there? Yeah, the last one is, I don't know, 2013 or even longer ago. Mm -hmm. Um 
Yeah, but the mechanism is still there, and so the the, the worry is always, of course, that it gets abused. Yeah, so they're so, deprecating that. I think with this, they can be completely removed, yeah. yeah. Um, I think there is a pull request open that would actually remove them. However, I th think the consensus now is to wait and see if there's not something else we forgot that, that the checkpoints are still for. So the checkpoint's main goal is to just is to prevent certain denial of service attacks and certain certain attacks where somebody will just completely waste your time chasing the wrong chain. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of that was already fixed by not downloading blocks immediately. So the original version of Bitcoin would just download one block at a time, whereas at least since 2015 or so, your Bitcoin node will download headers first until and and once it has enough headers up to a certain amount of proof of work in total which is hard coded in the in the code base with uh, i think it's assume work so it doesn't the node doesn't care what what blockchain you're downloading what the transaction history is but there has to be enough total work in it based on some observed thing that we saw like uh, close to the release we look at like how much work has, does there exist in the world and that that hint is saved in the source code mm -hmm. um, and that prevents it from chasing very low work, very long chains. So you could create a blockchain with trillions of terabytes of one megabyte blocks, starting from the Genesis block and all at difficulty one. So extremely low difficulty blocks. Mm -hmm. And then um, exploit maybe the time warp attack. I think you may have heard about that one where you can create blocks that are, that look like they're one second apart, or even I think they look like five of them and then one second goes by. So there's a lot of seconds since now in 2009 that you could create a bunch of blocks that way um, and then just waste, waste the computer's time with the blocks themselves. That would be huge, but even the headers for that would be quite large. Yeah. And so that's one reason those checkpoints are still there to protect against that type of attack because at least you have to... Uh, the, the part until 2013, you can't fake because that, that specific header has to be in there. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, we'd rather not keep doing that no. in the future. And, it create, yeah, it creates lots of potential for abuse. Checkpoints have been abused in altcoins to basically fake history, either because they were suffering from too many 51% attacks or maybe because the owner would like to have some coins that they're not really entitled to. Yes. It's happened recently. It did? Okay. And then with Assume Work, you can't fake work, so referencing that. Yeah, so assume work is more abstract than assuming a certain block. So you're mm -hmm. not saying this this block must exist because that's that's what a checkpoint does. It says this specific block must exist, but that's scary because then that block might not even be the most proof of work chain. It might just be a very low proof of work chain that you're enforcing uh, because that lower proof of work chain you made in your living room as a developer is where you got all the Bitcoin, and the real chain is where you got almost no Bitcoin, right? So you don't want to have that type of power in the hands of developers. But the work requirement is saying, no, there just has to be a chain, doesn't matter what it is, with this much work in total. So if somebody, some alien arrives and creates a new blockchain that is just as long as the one we already have, um, this software will accept that alien chain, no problem, as long as it obeys all the other rules. Whereas the checkpoint, it would not accept the alien chain, which perhaps in the case of the aliens is acceptable, but in general it's not. But the alien chain has to reference has to become consensus compatible by referencing. The alien chain right now has to contain, first of all, the Genesis block and then all the checkpoints. Mm -hmm. But if this change goes through the way it is now, at least if these checkpoints are removed, the alien chain only has to match the Genesis block. Okay. You could then, I guess, argue that even that's not necessary, but the Genesis block is kind of a sacred block at the moment. Like you cannot sync anything that doesn't have the right Genesis block. Yes. Very sacred block we're coming up to. The anniversary of the Genesis block in less than a month. I mean, every block is a end block anniversary. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, I guess we, maybe we wrap it up there. Bitcoin's going to be fourteen. Damn. Yeah, if you count from the Genesis block, which I think yeah. is reasonable because shouldn't you know white papers generally shouldn't be celebrated. This one probably might be, but <laughs> as a general rule, we uh, show us some real software, and that's the Genesis block. What do you think? 14 years old. Was there ever a point after which you started working on Bitcoin where you thought, oh, this isn't going to work? No, I think it, I mean, I, I don't 
think it's guaranteed that it's going to work, but so far it works. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's good. I haven't had concern about that. I mean, yeah, we, we talked about some of the long-term risk and especially I think around the regulatory capture risk. Uh, that I think is a bigger existential threat than anything else, but I'm not, I'm not negative. I know it's, it's, it's really come across the last two days as we've been conversing and getting to know each other in person more. Very positive person. I love that. Thank you. And I'm optimistic too. So the regulatory attack does come. I think the disdain for governments right now is at an all time high. I think that's a very local perspective from you. I don't think it is globally. <laughs> uh, I know in Europe, yeah. you guys love your governments. Well, some people do, some people don't. And then, of course, I don't know what the sentiment is in all of Africa yeah. uh, or all of Asia. So I guess different different places have very different kinds of governments and very different feelings towards them. And governments are not necessarily the only thing that they need to worry about, even when it comes to Bitcoin. Um, Corporations. I mean, at a global scale, the thing you want to worry about are the major power blocks, right? US, China, uh, and Europe. That's probably what... If you're worried about sort of regulatory capture, that's where you need to worry, because whatever the smaller countries do doesn't really matter in the scheme of getting 51% of the hash power on board. Um, so those are the three you need to pay attention to. Yeah. And so far, I don't think any of them, well, I don't think China wants to kill Bitcoin globally. They just want to keep it out of their own country, at least officially. Um, Europe doesn't seem to want to kill it, and the US doesn't seem to want to kill it. So... Not yet. So I'm not so much worried about that type of a direct attack. It's more about the sort of creeping KYC, um, that sort of stuff. Yeah. And there I don't really see anything. I'm there. I'm not that bullish. Like, I think that's definitely going the wrong direction. I do as well. I mean, particularly in Europe where they have this Orwellian bill on the table, right? U.S. too. Yeah, and here. And so in Europe, I, I guess the difference between the U.S. and Europe is in Europe you have... Maybe some very bad laws, but if you break the law, you don't, the, the consequences aren't as bad in the U.S. Maybe like if you violate even the slightest law, you spend 20 years in jail. Yes. So there's a different trade off there. But in general, the anti-money laundering-ish laws are uh, very much, the, the trade off the trade-off between privacy and this money laundering fighting is not, is, there's no balance there. Um, you know, Europe has a GDPR, the Privacy Directive, but if you're a business and you need to choose, you know, sometimes these laws are incompatible. And if you have to choose between them, the the anti-money laundering law wins. Because if you violate the GDPR, your worst case outcome, and that is really the worst case, is 4% of your global revenue that they might take from you if you, like, systematically keep violating that law at a massive scale. On the other hand, if you make even the slightest mistake violating uh, sanctions law, you know, your CEO goes to prison. Yeah. So then as a CEO, the choice is very simple. Now, the, the only thing that makes me optimistic in Europe is that there have been times when the uh, European Court of Justice basically struck down entire swaths of European law saying it was completely illegal. And some of these laws that were struck down are quite similar to the laws that are being created now. And these privacy watchdogs are warning that like, dear European Parliament, dear European Commission, if you keep making these anti-money laundering laws as unbalanced as you have been doing recently, we are going to try and try and kill these laws completely. And so I would not be surprised if at one point, suddenly, almost out of the blue, there's like one European judge that says this whole stuff is, as you Americans would say, unconstitutional, like no more KYC until you figure this out. That would be very cool. That might give us like five years of, of privacy. Uh, that's my most optimistic take on it. Like there could be something like that. I'm not going to count on it. <laughs> What are your thoughts on my thoughts? And the same might happen in the U.S., right? Maybe one day the uh, Supreme Court here says, like, hey, uh, this unwarranted surveillance thing, uh, remember that? No more KYC. Yeah, I would love that. Anywhere. Like, it'd just be completely illegal. KYC AML. But that's the only kind of force that's strong enough to resist this pressure, you know, on companies to individually comply and individuals to say, well, I don't like this violation of my privacy, but let me just upload my password here and upload it, upload my password there and fill in this little form. There has to be some very strong pressure against that to, to stop that. Yeah. More and people some, need some to wake ruling up. like that could do that. More people need to wake up and say, no, I'm done taking selfies with my passport. Uh, 
these companies have proven not to be able to secure this data and the criminals are just criminaling anyway. And most of the people writing laws are criminals as well. Um, but that's not happening. No, not yet. Not, not on a meaningful scale. And, and that's because, I mean, as, as Odell says, like you have to touch the stove, but stove is very slow. And what are your thoughts on Bitcoin circular economy? Well, that's one way to get more privacy still. Like right yes. now, that seems almost untouched. So if, you're, if your salary is in Bitcoin, you're fine. Like you're not being surveilled. Beyond the point that, you know, if you're an employee anywhere, you're being surveilled for being an employee, but you're not like, there's no KYC requirement for employees paying them out yeah. as far as I know. So that's fine. But then if you want to live somewhere, your landlord may not let you pay rent in Bitcoin. And if you want to be picky as a renter in a real estate market, Good luck in, <laughs> in Siberia, but uh, <laughs> maybe not in most places. So this circular thing is, uh, I would say it's probably better than it was eight years ago. Mm -hmm. There are more places where you can spend Bitcoin, but it's still very, it's very trivial. Small. And yeah. especially because your major expenses for most people, I would guess, are rent and taxes. Mm -hmm. Those two things, that, that th those are the biggest thing. And then, sure, you can buy your coffee with Bitcoin, but if that's only like 1% of what you're spending your money on, it's not very circular. No. Uh, and there's very few places where you can pay your taxes with Bitcoin. I think it's like Colorado. But not the federal tax, I guess. No. So. No. Taxes. So, I don't know about this. I would like to see that circular economy because that um, one good thing about that is it escapes the paradigm of the gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. So, the regulators at least in Europe and I guess in the US too, they, they kind of look at the, the the point where crypto goes into fiat and they call those the gatekeepers. And the, most of the monitoring happens at the gatekeeper level. So when you go in and when you go out, that's when you get all the KYC, the compliance, et cetera. But once you're in Bitcoin, you're good. You're sort of in this no man's land where you can do whatever you want. And so the circular economy means you can stay in that no man's land and gain more privacy over time. So even if the first time you bought Bitcoin, maybe you did go through KYC, but then you get your salary, you buy something, you get your salary, you buy something, and eventually you kind of blend in. Uh -huh. um, but there, that hardly exists, at least in the West. Yeah, It does exist in some other countries, perhaps. If you're a software developer in Venezuela, maybe it's a bit different. Yeah. Um, I'm becoming more partial to the idea that uh, the developing world is going to lead that charge. Yeah, I think so too. That's that's probably fair. Uh, I don't know where exactly it's going to happen. It's always because there's this narrative of look at this developing country. They're going to embrace Bitcoin. It's going to be amazing. I've heard and the remittance thing. I've heard that again and again since 2013, 2014. And every time it seems real. And then every time it turns out it doesn't really work. So I'm also skeptical. But it does seem at least if it takes off anywhere, it's going to be in a developing world much more likely than in the Western world. Yeah. Unless something like really bad happens with the financial system in the Western world, at which point then it, it might change. It becomes a a system of last resort. But even but even there I doubt it because then the problem is it's just it's too big, the Western world, for for to be able to adopt Bitcoin. Like this it wouldn't wouldn't work technically. So if like if if the economy in a very small country collapses, I would imagine they might jump the Bitcoin and, and be fine. But if the entire European Union or the entire U.S. economy collapses, the banking system collapses, they can't all start using Bitcoin. Um, probably. Just because not everybody's going to be able to use. Because the, just the blockchain doesn't work, the software is too hard to use, yeah. that sort of stuff. The only possibility there would be to use the fiat rails on top of Bitcoin, so then you, you, you would instantly get a Bitcoin standard. But you can do that with gold too, so I don't know if there's much of an advantage for governments. Right, you, you already have debit cards and you already have payment terminals and people get salaries wired to them. So you could just, if there's a dollar crisis, you could have banks saying, you know what, we're going to use the same infrastructure we already have. Your balance is just going to be in grams of gold mm -hmm. uh, or in units of Bitcoin. Maybe they'll try both yeah. uh, because then everything keeps working. You can still go to a shop. You can still swipe your card. It'll all work. Just the amounts are not in dollars, but in this, this new thing. Yeah, they're denominated in sats or... Grams or, in, of gold. or in grams of gold. And there, I don't think Bitcoin has much of an advantage over gold. Why not? Well, because you're still trusting a giant custodian. And I would actually, I trust banks more in their ability to hold gold. If they can show me that they actually have it, once they do that, it's much. Le I'm much less concerned about them getting their gold robbed than I am about a bank getting their Bitcoin stolen. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because it is so easy to steal Bitcoin, or at least rather to get Bitcoin stolen. That's why I'm also very skeptical of ETFs. Yeah, but, ETFs uh, are not the way to go. I mean, if, if people want it, it's their choice. But my guess is if there's $100 billion sitting in an ETF. It's a big honeypot. At some point, someone's going to steal that. Yeah. And it's going to be spectacular. <laughs> so, and I don't know if, if you can, if you're allowed to buy put options on these ETFs and whether those, the SEC would consider those valid if the theft happens or whether they say, no, that's off limits. We're just going to freeze the market and not pay you out. I mean, if history, but I would buy those options. If history, and I'm not going to rob anyone, just to be clear. I would just buy those options if they're cheap enough. Well, if the history gives us any indication of what would happen, they would just freeze the markets. It happened in nickel earlier this Might year. Might still be worth buying the options because you can price in that risk, I guess. Yeah, low risk. Uh, if it's like if it's like point one percent per year for those options, I don't know. I'm not Probably an options trader. It. Neither am I. No, just we'll have to ask the lab or someone. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't been able to ask him anything uh, in years. No. Are you blocked by him yet? Of course. <laughs> There's something quite innocuous. I think I pointed out that he made it onto the Bitcoin obituaries. Block. Yeah. I think at the time he was being harassed by so many crypto people that he just blocked anyone who even remotely mentioned it. So I kind of get it, but I don't know. I met him in an airport once. Okay. That was, that was fun. Coming back from Spain. I actually had the black swan in my briefcase. Yeah. Forgot to ask him to sign it. Oh, well, you, can, you still can. Just don't tell him who you are. Or that I'm blocked on Twitter. Yeah, just don't mention it. Yeah. Or do mention it. He might not even care. Like, it's not personal. That's what he always <laughs> says. So, um, yeah. yeah. I would still buy his next book, probably. It's like... His last one was... Fooled by Randomness was really good. Black Swan was very good. Black Swan was good. Uh, I read them out of order. I read Black Swan first, then... Um, we, Anti-fragile, and then fooled by randomness many years later. Yeah. Fooled by randomness was my favorite. Mm, yeah, Black Swan was my favorite because I read it first, I guess. Yeah. Um, I was talking to Leb on TFTC. There we go. Sure, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank and you. It was for, fun. Thank you for just showing up in Austin. Without any warning. And being willing to take up... How long have we gone? Two and a half hours? Two hours? Oh, man. Where are we? Yeah, two hours. Two hours. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for the work that you do on Bitcoin Core and trying to educate big people about Bitcoin. Um, it's very important work. Very uh, unappreciated work by many. I feel appreciated. So. Okay. Yeah, that's good at least. All yeah. right. Well, thanks for having me then. Well, hopefully we can do this again at some point. You're just going to show up in Austin. Hopefully I'm here. Exactly. Yeah. We get the um, the Bitcoin explained. The Van Weerdem and Shorznado. See, it's hard to pronounce, too. It's funny, though. Some people can pronounce it. So uh, Odell always has difficulty pronouncing my name, but then he had no difficulty pronouncing the name of the podcast. So, so I had to remind him, uh, point that out, that yeah. Shorz is pronounced exactly as in the Van Weerdem Shorznado, and then you can do it. And Matt, get it together. My wife is calling me. I'm going to go answer that. Peace and love, freaks. Dickie!